Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, here we are. Uh, Roy just stepped away for a second. So hello, we have hello. Roy and Gustavo here uh, currently. Hi, um, so hello to everybody. Uh, David Stewart is uh, doing his Scottish country line dancing tonight. Uh, he would not allow us to send a film crew to film him doing that. I just don't yeah. understand why. I, I don't know why he should uh, worry about that. But uh, but anyway, uh, we hope to get a few more people that visit us. And uh, I think we're going to have a very interesting show tonight. There's obviously a fair amount of things to talk about. Uh, first, we'll say hi to the uh, people that are in the house. We got uh, Mookie MC is here. And we got uh, Bob, our photos. Bob is uh is checking us out, making sure that we're still alive and well, and but we're gonna we're gonna have a um, fantastic um, presentation on underwater photography uh, techniques, um, available gear, cost, um, a little bit of uh, diving philosophy uh, when it comes to uh, how you know, diving with photo gear affects you underwater, which it does greatly. If you've ever done it, you know, it can really play havoc with you. It takes a while to get used to using it. Um, and uh, so it's going to be a great presentation. And, I, and Scuba Razi will be joining us, uh, anticipating him joining us at 10 p.m. Eastern time tonight. And um, I'll wait for uh, some more people to get in here before we talk about any uh, serious subject matter, and I hope everybody is well. Hello, Luke. I hope everybody is out there getting some great images, uh, depending on where you live. Hello, Tim. Mr. Mozman is in the house and in, in the chat. Um, Sal is here. Wayne is here. Hello, Wayne. How you doing? Uh, you know, we all have that time of year I'm sure wherever you live where uh, photo opportunities kind of get a little bit scarcer. <laughs> so that change, that, that in-between change of seasons where things start to leave and other things haven't come in yet, and uh, especially if you're talking wildlife. And so things kind of uh, bog down a little bit. And uh, Chuck is in the chat. Hello, Chuck. Great to see Hello, you. Hey, Chuck. Hi, how you doing? Hope you're well. Um, hope everything's going good. Hope you're breaking in that 600 uh, millimeter lens uh, the right way. <laughs> and uh, not Wayne's heading for breakfast, traveling to another part of Malaysia. Maribel's here. Hello, Maribel. I hope you're well. Um, I'm assuming that you're you're in Raleigh area at the at this present moment. Uh, which, if that's true, I hope you can get home as soon as possible. I know Chuck, I'm sure Chuck misses the heck out of you not being home. Um, but it's great to always have uh, you and Chuck visit the show. It's it's really appre uh, really appreciated. I know I really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody else does as well. And um, I do. Yeah. You know, and and when you were on the other day, Chuck, uh, last week it was. Uh, that was, I think that that got everybody's adrenaline pumped up. That's for sure. And Maribel's going to be home next weekend, so that's good. Uh, hello, Ava. How you doing? Good to see you. Glad glad to see that you're uh, a regular uh, in the chat, and that's great. Um, let's see. We got uh, who else? We got. So we're we're getting there. When we get to about twenty five people, um, we'll. Uh, We'll have a little. We'll start a little bit of a discussion. I don't want to get into any real hardcore meat and potatoes stuff until after uh, uh, Scuba Razi does his presentation. I mean, we'll talk about some some smaller topics. And um, we're up to eighteen. I want to uh, let's see. What can I what can I talk about? Um, for those who follow uh, Hudson Henry, I don't know how many people do, but I enjoy watching him as often as I can. And unfortunately, it's not as often as I would like, but he did just come out with a video titled Approaching the Scene, Episode 294, How to Practice and Shoot the Total Eclipse. 
with an exposure guide PDF file. So check it out if you're planning on taking those eclipse shots in Texas upcoming. You may get some, you know, some good tips out of that video. So once again, that's Hudson Henry's channel. And um, if you've never watched him, he's he's a very entertaining fellow. And and they sometimes they do, um, I think you know he'll do classes and he'll he'll do trips where he has people that join him, and they do some pretty huge prints when they when they decide to share some prints. They have some that are like, holy moly, I don't want to know what I sit there and I say I don't want to know what that print just cost you that came out of that printer, you know. <laughs> but they, they do like making very, very large prints at times. Uh, very, very cool stuff. Oh, very sound uh, advice that he provides for the clips. There is a ton of uh, uh, information about the clips, and uh, his recommendation to try it on before is a, is a good one, actually. Uh, and I I downloaded what he suggested. That he, he put for free his settings. Uh, I will create my own, but uh, it, it, it's, it's very good what he's uh, proposing there. Yeah, he's uh, okay. John is in the house. I'm going to put this up because, uh, uh, like I said, I was going to wait till we had a few more people in here. But I'll I'll, I'll just repeat. I'll probably re repeat this two or three times doing the show because for me, it's a it's a really big deal. Um, so my congratulations go out to Diana Ishi. She's made it to the top 10 out of 30,000 entries in the Smithsonian photo contest. So John sent me an email and he asked for those of us who view the yes, channel to vote for her on their website. So her image is under the category people. And I'm going to put this up on the screen in a second. It's titled contrast of time echoes of tradition and youth. And then there's the, the link to the Ooh. Smithsonian uh, that, that I am going to put on the screen. Give me a second here. And you could go there and you can vote. And I'll tell you, I looked at all the, and I'm not saying this because we know uh, Diana and we know John, honest to God. I looked very carefully at all the entries in that catalog and in that category that she's in. I don't think anybody touches what she did for an image. Her image to me was a different notch above, you know, what the, good. Other, what the other ones were. It, I mean, because it, it, the picture uh, told more of a story. Uh, some of the other uh, images were nice images, but hers really uh, grabs you and, and it's a black and white. So it has quite a dramatic effect. So I will, um, I will put up the information on the screen so you guys could write this down on a piece of paper or do a screenshot and capture this and that way you could go to the Smithsonian uh, photo contest uh, portion of their website and go under the category people and you will find her image and like I said right. it's titled contrast of time echoes of tradition and youth and um, please, please give her a vote. Um, what I didn't know is I went into some of the other categories because I'm assuming that the way, correct, Roy, you may know, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm assuming that basically they select a winner out of all these different, each category has a winner because it's a unique category. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at one of the other categories and I says, well, I'm going to vote on, on a picture in one of the other categories and it wouldn't let me because it only allows you to vote once, period, for within a 24 hour period of time. Uh, okay. So I, I guess you could vote for the same person more than once. You just can only put in one vote per day. That's what I'm assuming. I don't know that for sure, but I don't know if you try to vote for the same person a second time, if it's going to come up and say, eh, 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 you already did this already. You can't do that. And how many emails you've got. I don't know. Yeah. But Hey, at least vote for it once guys. You know, we got, we got enough people. That, that view the show uh, after the fact and uh, show some love, okay? Because uh, she did a she did a wonderful wonderful job, wonderful job. Um, you know, and, and I noticed that there were I noticed that on some of the other categories, 
the same photographer might might have their uh, image in uh, present still in multiple categories. So, I mean, there's some people that obviously are uh, hardcore professionals and probably every year they they submit some of their images in multiple categories uh, uh, if they're a, a photographer that shoots multiple genres. And uh, so because there was there were a few people in there I noticed had had images in different categories. So but um, Diana's is exceptional for the, the people category. So check it out. Well, that, that, being shortlisted to the 10. Yeah, it's be, already a, a big yeah. accomplishment. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, it, it, well, we we're all going to say we all know she's already a winner in our book. Exactly. <laughs> She doesn't need to have an award to be a winner. She's already a winner in our book. So, um, and, and John, it would be good to have Diana at one point to talk about with all the discussion that there is about the regulation to submit photos for photo contests. What is that she has to basically obey to in order to be able to submit that image? Right. That that, that would be an interesting topic for Diana to to bring here to the community. Yes, yes, you're yeah, you know, if you want to come on the show later, Diana, we'll, we'll say out if uh and and talk about it, that would be great. I mean, I guess we'd like to know what their, you know, briefly what their rules are, you know, maybe they just say it has to be unedited photo or what their criteria is, uh that kind of thing. Uh she did write in the chat here that you can vote multiple times, so if you vote for her on uh Tomorrow morning, vote for her again on Monday morning. <laughs> Now that I know sure. that, I, I will be voting multiple times. <laughs> and uh, Jeff and Leslie are in the house. Um, Jonathan de la Rosa as well. Jonathan, yeah. Sk skimming down here. Yeah. Um, Some guy named Gustavo. You, you got a twin brother with the same name? Because he's showing up in the chat. <laughs> exactly. I'm confused. I'm confused. <laughs> Just welcoming everybody here. She says maybe she can come on in a half an hour. She just woke up. Yeah, I mean, come on when you can. We got we got a um, an interesting underwater photography uh, little uh, presentation from Scubarazzi that's going to uh, be coming on in about 45 minutes. And if uh, you win, we made a virtual uh, celebration. I think well, we not uh, like I said, you're already a winner in our book, so we're already <laughs> gonna we're gonna let you know that. Um, that that's don't that's see that, underwater that, stuff anymore. That's a huge thing, you know. It really is, and her picture's wonderful. I mean, it really tells a really nice story. Without any words, it tells a story. That and that's a sign of a good photograph when you get a story. And to me, that's that's the difference. You know, like I know a lot of us are getting into video more. You know, you have that capability on your camera, and and we're and we're doing video clips, or some of us are getting even even beyond that and, and doing twenty minute, thirty minute straight videos and things of that nature. But to me, a a still image that can tell a story is so much harder to do than a video. A video you got you got however long you're gonna film to tell a story. When you could tell a story with a single image, that is special. That is amazing. That is what we that's what we all I think strive to do is to get an image that tugs on your heart or makes you cry or makes you happy or makes you just say, Wow, how in the heck did that person get that shot? And um, we all want to have a few of those, you know what I mean? They're, they're few and far between. You know, we all get uh, very good photos, but then that, that pile of, of those that, that you yourself can't believe you got, that's a very small pile, you know? <laughs> well, for, for sure, it's had two different ways of communicating, correct? It's a, a completely different. One is... Uh, I mean, in a way, film requires more work, but it is, it's um, more forgiving. 
the, the a single image, as you said, is uh, very, very, very difficult to have everything. It's like, like a caricature, correct? Yeah. When, when you get a, a caricature uh, well done, it has so many layers of meaning, correct? Compared with a long paragraph of the story and an article in the newspaper. This comment from uh, Tim uh, is obviously, I didn't know that Tim spread fake news, uh, but this is obviously fake news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the link is in the chat, Tim. Or I mean, I can't put the live link, but it's I've, I've got the path here. I'll put it back on for you. Um, give me a second. You'll have to write it down, unfortunately, but the, the link is on the bottom here to get to the photo contest. Um, and, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, I mean, like I said, that's what we all strive to do. Uh, and, 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 and let's, and let's face it though. Like I say, sometimes the best photograph you ever got was the one you got by accident. You know, something that, you know, you could you could kind of pre-plan or plan out a routine, what you're going to do that day, where you're going to go, what you're anticipating you're going to be able to get. But lots of times that that image that strikes that strikes you is the one that was unplanned, the one where something just happens and you you were fortunate that you were there at the right time to get it. Um The um, let's see here. What else do I got? We got. Um, oh, we got 28 people on here, so I'll, I'll share these. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting someone who has been part of the panel, um, both on AP Studios and on on uh, on my reiteration or my iteration of uh, of Chuck's work here on this channel. Um, we haven't seen him in a while. We've seen him in the chat once in a while, but uh, he had a lot of stuff going on uh, and uh, things are starting to kind of calm down for him a little bit. So he, he uh, hinted to me that he would hopefully be showing himself up on the panel uh, sometime soon. So I will give me a second and I will show you a few images and you will know right away who it is. And, um, so let me, we've got Randall coming in. Give me a second, Randall, uh, to get these images up here. So this is in front of my house. So I, I get a, a, a text message Thursday, this past Thursday, of someone who's en route traveling uh, home from a, a previous destination and has to go through my neck of the woods and wanted to meet me and talk with me. And, and we ended up uh, getting together at my home and having a real nice talk. And he was with his wife and we went out to dinner and had a great time. And um, so uh, we had Mr. David Moots. Woo! So David stopped by, which was uh, a privilege was really, really uh, wonderful to meet him um, and his wife, Debbie, um, who I will uh, put on the screen <clears throat> now because you really don't need to look at my picture very long. Um, let me find, uh, find the other image. So here's, here's David with his, with his wife. And, um, and those are real palm trees, even though they're not native to South Carolina. For some reason, they think they should be, and they put everybody puts them in their yard. Uh, these were already here when I moved in. So, but uh, <laughs> everybody thinks uh, these are these are native to uh, this neck of the woods. But you know, this isn't Florida, as, as I say. <laughs> but I thank uh, David and his wife for stopping by. We had a good time. We had good conversation. And um, David hopes to uh, be able to join us on the panel uh, soon, very soon. Was he on a photographic trip, or it was kind of a business trip with a with a very little bit of pleasure? Um, 
they they had to make a trip to um, to Florida uh, on business. And uh, while they were there, he was I know he sent me a picture of a snail kite, uh, which oh, was really bad. cool. Um, and on his way down and then he uh, he told me, what, you know, what time he was going to be in my area. And that, it just happened to work out good. My wife was going out with her friend for dinner and wasn't going to be around. And I says, I'm on my own. I got to eat. Why don't you guys swing over and we'll go out to eat? <laughs> so we talked and then uh, and then my wife got home before they left so that she was able to talk with them for a good hour before they, they left to go back to the hotel. And then he uh, asked for a suggestion of where to take some pictures early morning on Friday morning as they were just before they were going to start driving home. And then he says, should I go to the park? And I said, no, don't go to the park. And I, I said to go to where a few days prior, uh, I had gotten some nice oyster catcher shots. And uh, so he texted me after the fact to say, oh, yeah, I had like seven oyster catchers fly by us. And, um, and hopefully some of them, you know, there should have been hopefully two that are getting ready to nest in that area and hanging around. So he... Um, he, it worked out for him. Hello, Randall. It worked out for him. I think you got us on another feed, Randall. We're here at Echo. Uh, I got everything off. Yeah. I hear my voice echoing real bad. One Jeffrey's enough. One Jeffrey's enough. <laughs> one, voice, one Jeffrey voiceover is more than enough for anybody. Okay. We don't want to get sad, Jeffrey. No. No, we already had sad Jeffrey in my last video. And um, I'll put this up quick and then go back to the other one. Is um, this came up on Nikon Rumors and Tim is uh, reminding me of it here. Uh, they have um, Nikon sponsoring the 2024 Comedy Wildlife Awards. Grand prize is one week safari for two in Kenya. And I laughed and I says, I don't have any funny wildlife photos. All my all the birds I shoot are very serious. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I don't get any that wanna, you know, I, I don't find any birds that are as funny as me. I hate to say it. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. But um going back to Mr. Moots. Uh, snail cat, snail kites are wonderful. They the the snails are gigantic. The you apple know, snails. The apple snails are huge. Yeah. Did, huge. did did he get a male or a, or a female or immature? I don't you know. know. I I it was a, it was just sent over the phone. You know, it wasn't okay. like they, uh, they, an email they, or like, anything. You know, the the males are gray, correct? So. So they are very distinctive with a, a little bit of red in the beak. So anyway, we wait. We wait for for him to to join and chose chose here in one of the in one of these uh, live stream. Yeah, I mean, hopefully he'll. Um, hopefully, what he'll be able to do is um, put that in the. Oh, here's what I'm going to try to do. Come on. It's not going to work, is it? Come on, <laughs> phone. All right, we're gonna we're gonna do it the hard way here. Ah, that looks like a male to me. Beautiful. Looks like a pigeon to me. <laughs> <laughs> not well. All, bird, all birds are just evolutionary versions of pigeons. Yeah, I miss Zach. <laughs> hey, here he is. How you doing, John? Congratulations to your wife once Hi. again. Yeah. On mute, John. On mute. You're on mute, John. We don't hear you. I don't hear you. And I'm still echoing for well, some reason. For some reason. Still no voice, John. 
You must have had chili like I had tonight. When I had some chili, all of a sudden I lost my voice for a few seconds. My wife thought it was funny. I said, it's a little hotter than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> I like chili. Chili good. Yeah, nothing, John. Okay. He's gone. He's hiding. Still echoing. I'm still echoing, Rand. You're in. Because I wasn't echoing until you came on. Well, I'll test this. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut you down for a second and bring you back on and see if the echo goes away. Am I not echoing now? Correct. I don't hear nope. an echo. Now I'm gonna bring you back on, and we'll see if I'm still echoing. Up. Oh, it went away. Okay, Randall, you looked at your computer long enough, and it it, it decided it did not want to face your wrath, so it's behaving behaving now. And uh, no, but we cannot hear you now. Now we can't hear you. <laughs> it's going to be one or the other. Me with an echo, but we can hear you, or or no echo, and we can't hear you. I don't know. Isn't technology wonderful? Yes. Yes. I like this. <laughs> shame, shame. Everybody knows your name, as they say. <laughs> yeah. What else? What else do we got? Uh, hopefully. Hopefully. What's on the Kenan shirt? Yeah. But, Let's uh, not be political. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm sure we have a handful of cannon shooters in the crowd, and that's fine. I feel sorry for no one shooting Nikon. That's the one. That's the one camera I used to have. There, um, trying to think of what it was called. It was like a. Uh, it was a smaller, compact, thirty-five millimeter camera. Uh, G something. G seven. G five. Um, I'm echoing again. I guess. Um, yes, I am. I'm not going again. It was a really, really nice. Uh, this was back in the film days. It was a very nice uh, camera. 5D. Still a cut left from Canon. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, Maz, man, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna want to camp out near the Gators this year because they have no food, and I'm and I'm a good size uh, target <coughs> for a, a food supply. So uh, I don't want to. I don't want to dip my toe into the water at all. Let me. Let me tell you. We get a lot of people dragged into the rivers here, mostly tourists. <laughs> Leslie, it's not being talking bad yeah. about cannon now. <laughs> we we're, we're we're only teasing. I mean, mm. I did have a cannon, several cannons in my lifetime, and I'm not talking about, about one I'm not talking about the ones that that uh, David Stewart took pictures of shooting. Uh, not real cannons. Canon cameras. We got John trying to come back in again. Hopefully, we'll be able to hear him. Can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you now. Yes, yes. You're good. Good. I, I, but <clears throat> you see, with the daylight saving time, you guys changed, and now it's an hour earlier. Oh, so you okay. don't have to leave as early because you're, yes, you're having breakfast later. <laughs> 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 now when you say, oh, I got to leave for breakfast, we're going to say, wait, 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 time change, time check, time check. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks, guys, for helping Diana. Oh, jeez, our pleasure. She she it. Our pleasure. Yeah. I will I will vote for her again. Now that I know I could vote every day, I will vote every day. Because <laughs> I have the link on my, on, my, on my saved setting on my computer here so I can get to it quick. <laughs> But it is by far the best image in that category. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about oh, it. My that's opinion. good. Um, well, but um, you know, I was going to uh, I, I was going to mention that you were talking about that one particular shot of people. You know, you'll get that rare one shot in a lifetime. And so last night, I was I, I just happened to see on YouTube that this photographer for AP, I think it was Bob Jackson, shot that picture of uh jack ruby shooting lee harvey oswald remember that picture yeah okay so that's capturing the moment 
Right. So the the interesting part is this: there was two photographers. It was Bob Jackson, and there was another guy who worked for UPI, and they were assigned to the to to the to the sheriff's office because they're transporting uh, Oswald. And the first guy from UPI had a Mamiya Mamiya Flex, right? And he wanted to take a high shot. So he's been camped out for like several hours to, to take the shot of the sheriff bringing in uh, Oswald. And he wanted to get a shot like this. Meanwhile, Bob Jackson, I think it was AP, he had a Nikon S3 rangefinder, right? And he was at ground level. So when Oswald came and Jack Ruby came out and came out with his gun pointed, the guy who worked for UPI with the Mamiya Flex took the picture as uh, uh, Jack Ruby was going to fire, but not yet fired. Bob Jackson shot it one sixth of a second later. And got the shot, the fatal shot of uh, Oswald grinning in pain. And the 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 guy, the the UPI photographer, looked at his 120 film and he says, "I missed it." And it's he went into draw. he went into depression. <laughs> I can imagine. And Bob Jackson, he's still alive today, still making money off that picture. <laughs> so, so the moral of the story: use Nikon. <laughs> uh oh! Now, 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 now we're gonna get the Canon crowd upset again. <laughs> I oh, here you want? Uh, I'm gonna share uh, with you on the screen here a a a camera that. Roy uh, was sharing with us behind the scenes before the show started okay. and see if any of you guys have ever seen one of these or if you know where one is, let Roy know so he could try to buy it off the guy who owns it because I think he would definitely buy it. So we're going to put it up on the screen and let Roy talk about it. It's a stereo Nikon. They just mated two Nikon AMs together and made a stereo Nikon. And it's incredibly rare, and I haven't. Seen, I've been looking one for about twenty years or so, and never seen one. Uh, Nikon made this. Yeah. Weird, isn't it? Isn't that crazy. I'll have to ask Mister Wu. Maybe he's got one. <laughs> <laughs> if he has, I'll, I'll book my plane ticket tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, if he if he has one in a case, John, when he turns around, take it out, ship it to Roy, and just say, "I don't know where it went, Mister Wu. I just, I really, I really don't know where it went." <laughs> so, 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 Roy, probably you had to advance the film maybe two or three times to get two new oh, it, films yeah, in position. It takes two pictures on each each time. Exactly. So, so it's stereo. probably not a single. Crank. That's a true stereo camera. <laughs> But isn't that cool looking, man? When you, if you thought one Nikon was cool enough, here's your double trouble, double trouble. Oh, yeah. Siamese twins. Yeah, yeah. Or, or if you don't like Nikon, then you're looking at two instead of one, and that makes you even feel worse, right? <laughs> but that's that's a cool camera. That is cool. It is. There's no doubt about it. We've got uh, what else we got going on here? I don't want to go like I said. To I guess the only thing I could let me see. I could bring up. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> ah, okay. We got something here showing. Roy's sharing something here. Another picture. Ooh, oh, that's good, Roy. He brought me a present. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I, I don't think you're going to complain if they're wiping those out for you. <laughs> you you see, Jeff. This is quality. The conversion, the conversion process is completed. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm still useless at birds. No, no, no. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Uh, you see, Roy, close up in the kind of pyramid of quality of image, correct? So you got a portrait, fine. You get a close up the next step. Now you get close up with some. Uh, you know, food item. That's the next level. So, so that's good. And, and those magpies are wonderful. 
Yeah, that's cool. That is cool. I like that. <laughs> I like that. We got uh, Albert. I'm glad uh, we got Albert. And, I'll send uh, Albert two EMs if he wants to try it. He can join them together somehow. <laughs> Albert, I couldn't agree with you more. And yes, I am pushing for people to vote for Diana. But I think the thing is, I think like like I stated, if you look at all the other images in that category, her stands out more than any of the other ones by far. So uh, even if you say, well, I'm going to vote for who I want for, who I think has the best picture, uh, I guarantee you you're going to be voting for her anyway. So uh, it really is a really is a special shot. It really is a special shot. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, two, two memory cards in the film era. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we get some, funny, get some funny comments, don't we? <laughs> That's funny. We've got, we've got, uh, it's nice to know that we're surrounded by, uh, folks there that are as crazy as we are. That we're not with as I say, we are not alone. We are not alone. Uh, we all have a bad case of gas. Um, we all get ourselves in trouble. We all don't know when to stop looking at new things or old things and buying things. And you know, it's a disease. I like quirky camera gear, though. Yeah, uh, David, uh, David, David's in the house here in, in the chat. Yeah, it's, this is funny with the, the – I'll have to tell you a little dog story. Yeah, David, it was a pleasure meeting you, know, you obviously, and your wife as well, who also takes wonderful uh, images. And uh, she made a comment that she – you know, obviously she takes wildlife photos, you know, when David's, you know, doing the wildlife photo thing, and she's doing that with him. But she likes to take uh, street photography and uh, landscape photography. Um, she likes doing that, I think, a little bit more, but she is an active participant with David when he goes out shooting, which which I think is great. Um, and they have a lot of fun together, and they've gone to a lot of – they've gone to uh, Yellowstone. Uh, they've gone to all the parks in Utah. They've gone to a lot of national parks. Uh, and and uh, I think they're getting ready or, or going to be going to Alaska sometime in the near future as well. So – uh, we can look forward to um, we can look forward to some more great images from uh, from David and, and and his wife. And, and he owns so, a couple of pictures already because he he was going to show some pictures from the John. Uh, I got it here. Put, blog on the 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 on. Sorry, sorry, interrupting here. Someone asked for the link. It's at the bottom of the screen. Here is the link to vote. Um, so, and, and where to go to category people, the title of her image. So it's all right there. So I will, I will put that up on and off during the course of the show, because we're going to get people leaving new people coming in and, uh, we want to at least give people the opportunity. And, you know, while you're in there, look, look, believe me, look at all the images. If you have time, look at all the images and all the categories, because there's wonderful stuff in there. Um, and uh, but you can only vote once per day. So um, but definitely check out the other images in the other categories. I mean, they got wildlife. They've got, you know, uh, all, all sorts of different categories. I, I looked at them all uh, while I was on there. It, it took me a while. I, I, I don't know. I guess I glossed over or missed. I kept looking. I go, where where is Diane's? In, where's her image? I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. And I'm like, what am I blind? I can't find it. You know. And then all of a sudden, finally, it's like, oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, definitely, definitely worth definitely worth checking out. John, you know when they when do they actually uh, when is that contest ending? When are they going to actually publish the winners? Do you know? Uh -huh. I think it's in April. In April? I, I, yeah, I don't know the exact date. So yeah. She she would know. She, she's coming on as soon as she dries her hair and stuff. Okay. But um, let's see what else we got here. Um, I didn't mention it last week, and it's kind of a news that's a couple weeks old now, so you guys probably already know about it. But the 
The ZFC came out with a firmware update, which is now 1.60. It's nothing that, well, I'm going to zip it. Zip it. More background color options are now available on the information display in the setup menu. Has a welcome screen, and that is like a randomly generated thing. They'll they'll have a, a screen that has multiple images of ZFC cameras in different color, in all the different color combinations. That is not something that you can make come up by default. That's something that the camera on occasion will just show you that image, and you have no way of of making it be the default. It's just a uh, so randomly generated image that will come up every once in a while. Um, they added the red record frame indicator to the custom settings menu. Um, if you go to G7 in the custom settings menu, and then they fixed a small, <coughs> they, smixed, they fixed a uh, bug that they had where they're in release mode, you cannot be properly adjusted using the function button in auto mode when release mode was assigned to that function button. So I don't know. I don't have a ZFC, but you know there there wasn't really a lot in that firmware update. It was more of a uh, of I call it blingy stuff, more bling than than substance. It was, it was something that. Gives you that little extra cool factor, but doesn't actually make your camera perform any better. Uh, so that was kind of it for that. Um, I am going to talk about um, Nikon's acquisition of Red a little bit later on. Not right now. Uh, there were some articles that were written in different magazines, and I just wanted to share uh, their commentary or their opinion um when it came out um but the 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 funny thing is uh i will mention one thing here because we got a few minutes before scuba razi uh will pop in here uh, nikon rumor said uh here's here's what they think that you can expect from the recent acquisition red um one thing i one rumor popping out there over and over again i think is ridiculous but uh, future Nikon sensors will be co-developed with RED and mass-produced for lower prices. Nikon will start making cinema lenses for the Z, for Z mount with T-stops instead of F-stops. He says he assumes the next RED camera will be with a Z mount. Um, they'll slowly introduce new RED formats and video recording options to Nikon cameras. I think that's a safe assumption. Nikon Z63 camera announcement may have something to do with the red acquisition. I don't think it has anything to do. I don't think it has anything to do with the red acquisition at all. There are people out there that think that the Z63, and if this happens, I would be totally blown away and shocked, by the way. But I, I find it very hard to believe that people are talking like, oh, when the Z63 Z6, Z6 comes out, it's going to have red raw in it instead of Nikon raw. Uh they haven't signed. They have not completed the deal yet. There's no way they're sharing technology early. They're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. They're not going to share. Good program as it read though, so maybe they could be useful. Um, Chuck, I'll send, you, I'll send you a link in in a second here. I'll just finish this list quick. Uh, they say, um, okay, they're assuming that this 2024 NAB show next month that they may announce the Z63, but of course we all thought they would have or should have or could have done it the last quarter of last year and that didn't happen either so who knows um and nikon nraw will become red raw because adobe just mentioned online are no longer going to make upgrades to nikon nraw because it will be replaced so okay that that's probably a safe uh assumption as well so i'm going to pause for a second let you guys see what's going on in the chat so i can send the link over to Chuck. Uh, and Nancy, yes, uh, uh, Jeff planned to talk about this uh, C9 firmware 5 later on. Yeah, later on. We're not going to talk about it before Scuba Razi comes on because I don't want to, I don't want to start a conversation about it and then have to stop you know, 20% into the discussion and then go back to it afterwards. So we're just going to wait until after we, uh, after we do other things. Um, give me a minute here to 
<coughs> send uh, send Chuck a link. Chuck doesn't wish to join. I don't think he's probably tired. Yeah, I mean, I did send him a link. Um, I'll send it again in case he doesn't have it. But if he wants to come on, he can come on. That's that's obviously entirely. Well, well, Chuck, yeah. please, because Chuck has friended her on um, YouTube. What is it? I know, Facebook. The uh, yeah, I mean, it's Chuck normally crashes around ten o'clock. So, uh, but if he <laughs> wants to pop in and just say hi to everybody, that would be fantastic. That's up to him. Uh, I sent him the link. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, is Nancy here? Okay. See, I, yeah. when I have when I put on the, uh, some of the stuff on the screen, and I lose my chat, and I gotta go switch back to the chat again. Um, da, da, da. Randall's Leica looks interesting, doesn't it? Yeah. So Nancy Jane, nice to see you. Good. To, it's been a long time. We haven't had you in the chat in a long, long time. And congratulations, as I said, I think last week. Uh, on your uh, decision to retire, I believe, at the end of December of this year. So uh, I'm sure um, that NASA is going to miss you immensely, and I'm sure they're going to try to bribe you into staying longer. Uh, but hopefully you resist the bribe and you retire when you want to. Um, and, uh, and that you could get out there and do things that you want to do. Ready to move to the beach? Well, we got a we got a beach here in Myrtle Beach. You move down here. We got plenty of photo clubs. A lot of photo clubs down here. You could join. A lot of different types of photography you could do down here. And uh, great beaches. Obviously, you get like I don't know how many millions of people come here every year to go to the beaches. It's crazy. It's in the tens of millions. That of turns me off. That come down here to go to the beach. Many people. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you you. you Believe me, it, it, well, so many people now live down here. I mean, I've been, before my wife and I moved down here, we vacationed down here for probably, geez, more than 30 years. And we and we came down here, most of our vacations were down here. We, we did the traditional, okay, take the kids to, to Florida to go to Disney and Universal Studios and all that stuff. And then we would say to the kids, my dad actually had a place in Florida for a little while. And, I, and I'd say to the kids, OK, you guys want to go to Florida and stay, stay at grandpa's place or you want to go to Myrtle Beach? And they'd always say, we want to go to Myrtle Beach because uh, there is enough more than enough things to do down here between uh, uh, shows that you could go see, you know, musicals and stuff like that and amusement park type stuff for kids and. Uh, go-kart racing and parasailing and banana boat rides and, you know, jet skis and all sorts of stuff and, and plenty of beachfront. So um, it does attract, it does attract a lot of people, but there's so many people that now live here. The, the congestion on the roads, even in the wintertime, which, which used to be dead Traffic on the roads now in the wintertime down here is as bad as it was 20 years ago in the summertime when all the tourists were here. That's how many people have moved down here in the last 20 years. Absolutely crazy, crazy amount of people. But uh, Thanks to is it cost too many people. Cost okay. What's that? How's the cost of living? Is it reasonable or? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, food, clothing's a little cheaper because you got discount stores. Food's the same. Uh, car insurance is the same. Property tax on your car is the same, but property tax on your house is considerably less. So assuming that you're coming down here and buying a house, you're going to pay way, way, way less on your property taxes on a house down here than you are if you live in New England. Uh, All right, games. So so that's really the main thing. I mean, they don't you don't pay taxes on Social Security income. Um, you know, if you're 65 or older, you get a uh, your retirement. If you get a, if you're getting a pension or drawing money out of your 401k, you, you, the first twenty thousand dollars of that income is not taxed. So it's not as tax friendly as Florida, but it is tax friendly at least right now. And John, you look so much better now. I don't know what you did. 
but you're, you're looking so good, John. We're going to put you on the big screen. Oh, gee, John's still there. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, congrats. Congratulations. Hi. Wonderful, wonderful. Love your photo. Image, love your photo. Thank you. Thank you for the shout out. And uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, really, really thank you. Uh, and also for uh, voting for the image. Uh, Do you so mind I just, sharing, can you share the story behind that image and when you took it? Yeah. And in fact, actually, I, sh I just sent you some uh, photos uh, into your email. Is it possible to uh, pull it up? Yes. Yeah. Every, just, anything is possible on this show. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> you want me to share this? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Oh no. Oh, that was horrible. <laughs> oh no. It's now it's everybody's wondering why I'm saying why I'm saying oh no. I gotta save the files to my desktop folks and then I can bring them up and uh give me a second to do so. Uh I just keep saying oh no. <laughs> 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 I think let me okay uh how many image did you send me how many were there oh uh, there were i think four three or four okay. i think four or image oh no, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay i'll start with the first i'll share the first oh no <laughs> oh no image oh yeah i'm gonna i'm not i gotta shut up i can't stop saying oh no <laughs> you're you're killing us, Jeff. <laughs> no, I'm killing you. You know, uh, I don't. Yeah, I can't say that word again. I can't do it. I, I got to be good here. So give me a second. So you know why I'm saying oh no in about two seconds. Oh. oh. <laughs> now you could say oh no. Come on, all at the same oh. time. Oh no. no. <laughs> wow. 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 Well, um, that, that's actually part of the story of that image. Uh, the image I submitted uh, was taken a day before this happened. And uh, I, uh, the camera that used that I used to take that image uh, was the 907 Hasselblad 907-50C. And the day after that, I was carrying that image <laughs> It was the exact camera. I carry the same camera on one side with the 60, uh, 68 mm XCD lens. And then on the other side, I have the Leica SL with uh, another lens, a 2470, a 2470 lens. And with both of those cameras, I was in a rice paddy with John and it was after rain. And so what happened is that my shoes got a lot of mud, you know, in, inside the shoes or underneath the shoes. And I slipped and fell and tumbled backwards into a drain uh, inside the rice paddy and with the water, which is about this high. And when I fell, uh, the hassle block went into the bottom of the water. Oh, and, and, and then we will, have we will show that we will show well <laughs> one of the this images is, this is the exact whew, camera it's the exact camera that took the photo by the way it's not waterproof <laughs> <laughs> yeah when they spiked it <laughs> so uh, that, that was uh immediately you know after I got out uh, from the water and John was, and then and my guy was trying to pull me out of the water. And and when, as I fell, uh, my Leica hit me on the eyes here. Wow. So, and then that's why I had a bad, black eye for about one month. And luckily it didn't really hit you know, my eyeballs because otherwise I would have gone blind. Uh, so that was a big lesson learned that you know no picture is worth risking your life um so wow. yeah. and then and then i found a t-shirt you know to say black eye that was the first picture that you saw that was yeah awesome. let me i'm trying to find okay i got a different image here i gotta i gotta get out i gotta go back i gotta 
stop stop sharing and then I go gotta go back in and find the find the other picture here. Yeah, that that the that the hustle block broke, you know, the broke into two parts, you know, the now seven and then the fifties, it just went separately. Uh and I sent the camera back to Germany. Uh, no, sorry, you know, so, uh we sent it back to to YL camera. And then uh, basically they took a look and then they said uh, it's impossible to rescue this camera. Wow. So photo right off, you know, and then the lens, uh, we thought I can fix it. And then, but at the end of the day, it just won't work. The contact points of the lens are destroyed. So then uh, it was another write off, you know, for that. Painful. Yeah, no. very now on the good news side because that was like oh no four times or well, 40 times if you listen to me 40 oh no's um let us let us uh let us let us go let us go positive here for a second and and share a uh, a larger image of what you submitted for the contest and uh Okay. And we'll let you talk about your image. Oh. Hopefully everybody can see it. Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is the image I took in Bali uh, and I titled it in uh, the contrast of time because actually this, this photo was taken. The girl, uh, she was a dancer. She is a dancer, she still is a dancer. And she just performed a dance for, for us, me and John, and in an art gallery. And so it was like, uh, you know, her dance is really amazing. It's about, you know, an earth dance. And that's why she has a mask. She's holding that mask on her, on her hand. Uh, so that is, the mask is part of her dance. So this picture was not, this captured, not, not during her dance. It's, after she finished performing for us and she was tired so she have a break and then that's that you know the old lady you know she was the caretaker of the gallery and then she just sat next to her and these these two are not related and but somehow you know they they can you know in bali everybody works in a community so everybody is very uh, friendly and nice to each other so she sat next to her, just like talking to her grandma or something. Well, that's and what I thought. I thought it was a granddaughter, grandmother it, shot yeah, is my initial is. thought. Yeah, but they are not. They are They're just not, two, yeah. and two unrelated strangers. And so, and then she was talking and I said, hey, you know, this is nice. You know, the, the, the lights just hit them just beautifully. And, and at that time, my now seven was still on a tripod. So I shifted the position and then take a shot of that. Uh, so it just turned out to be quite uh, nice because I, I saw the contrast between the two, an old lady with a lot of wrinkles um, in her, on her face and a very young girl, she's only like 19 years old. Uh, so it, it just like, you know, an older woman, uh, I shouldn't say older, a senior woman, and then uh, a young girl, uh, it's just like this, this contrast and then what, what lies in her uh, for the young lady? And then what are, were the stories of this uh, elderly lady? Uh, so it's it just such a um, contrast between two very different time. And it's linked by one culture, one tradition. So that, that, was, that was the reason why I shot this. Picture. Loved a lot. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. And like you said, I mean, if the fact that, well, I don't know, I mean, maybe I'm the only person, but I, I think there would be others that would have thought it, this was a, a where they were related to each other. So I mean, just saying it, it with an image, when you can get an image of two, two total strangers, basically, and a wow. person looks at that image, and feels that it's a grandmother granddaughter uh, special moment. That makes the picture even more impressive because they're not related, but you yeah. but it has that power in that image to make you think that it is 
that it is family. Uh, and uh, what it just wonderful shot, just absolutely wonderful shot. Thank you. And, and so, Diana, this is all natural light, correct? Yeah, yeah, it is all natural light. Uh, so when I submitted the photo to uh, the competition, uh, they asked for the raw file. Now, mm -hmm. the reason why I like this particular competition is that they do not allow a lot of Photoshop adjustment. Mm -hmm. So they only allow you to crop and then, you know, the, adjust the level, the contrast. You can dodge and burn, mm -hmm. but you can do, I mean, like layers of Photoshop or, you know, um, you know, removing the objects. So the so the uh, shot has to be uh, correct, you know, in the first place. So in January, I got an email from them. They asked me for the raw file. So I have to go and look for the raw file and then submit that raw file. And then uh, along with that, they needed a, mo a model release for both ladies. Wow. So because then, because it's a copyright issue, so mm -hmm. I I have three days to look for these two women again in Bali. Ooh. But I couldn't go to Bali because it was during Chinese New Year, so and I have work. So I call up my friend in Bali, and I say, "Please, Koman, please, could you help me with that?" And my my friend say, "Sure, Diana, I'll help you." And they are just such nice people the Balinese wow and and Coleman uh willing to help me and Coleman he himself had an accident uh just a few months before his uh something exploded inside his house and he got burned like you know quite seriously wow. so we don't have the money to him and but for him to uh, we, he he said he was willing to help me and to locate these two women, the first, the older lady is much easier to locate because she is a caretaker of the gallery. So it's easy to find her. But the, the girl is from a remote part of the village. Wow. And Bali, though it is a, an island, is actually quite big. And for, for him to go and in his motorcycle to go and find the, the woman and to explain to her in Indonesian what it is and try to convince them to sign for me. I mean, that take, that took a lot of work. So, wow. yeah, that was the story behind this. So, uh, so, this. so, so Diana, uh, I'm glad yeah. it was where you have this friend here in Bali. If it will be one of your Mongolia photos, then you have to send somebody to Mongolia. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? Now, now, after this experience, I learned mm -hmm. two things. The first thing is when you shoot, because normally I don't enter photo contests, but this is one of the contests I I like because of they don't allow a lot of uh, post-processing and it's very prestigious. Uh, I, I don't know how big the Smithsonian, you know, um, museum is. I, oh, I've never been big. There. As big as you can, I mean, it's one of the main museums in Washington. Yeah, so I have no idea how big it is and how prestigious it is until John explained to me. So I said, okay, fine. So I tried to, to um, enter, see if I make it. But uh, the the thing that I learned from this photo shoot is that always get a model release if you're mm. in a remote area. I always now carry the model release with me when you shoot. Yes. Uh, so you yeah, so this is one of the lessons I learned from entering this contest. And the second thing is you must shoot uh, the first picture correctly. Uh, you cannot just say, oh, I'll go back and then Photoshop it. Or, you know, you, you cannot because at the end of the day, uh, you can adjust a little bit of the photograph and you have to use the right lens for the, for the right focal length. Because if you use the wrong focal length, you may have to crop a lot. And if you enter photo contest, you know, that may not be a very good thing. You know, they may reject it because you, you crop too much. So using the right focal length for the lens and also uh, carry the model release and shoot it right in the beginning. The raw file has to be clean. If you see a piece of rubbish on the ground, remove it. Because, you know, you can say, oh, later, you know, just a small piece of 
of rubbish. It doesn't matter. But it, once you remove or modify an object, you know, in the raw file or in, in anything, it, it is it's no go for any competition. Oh. Uh, or for, for, you know, this kind of very strict competition. Yeah. Local regulation for sure. Oh, nature for, yeah, nature for sure. Because I have seen uh, read stories about, you know, uh, photos that have been given an award and later was disqualified uh, be because they um, clean up, you know, certain thing like a piece of rubbish mm. in the background. Or, or maybe uh, one of the photo is a wildlife photo with the elephant ear and the holes inside the elephant ears. And they they want to clean up the ears, you know, so that the holes uh, is not Let's so drop the ears. Yeah. 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 That, and then you can't do that. And they find out that you can't do that. So they yeah. It should be like you said, you adjust the blacks, you adjust the whites, you you mm. you you tweak the brightness a little if you have to, and you and you crop a little bit and that and most most competitions will allow you to do that. But when you start mm. getting into like you said, doing creating multiple layers and and removing objects from the photo and stuff like that, they pretty much a lot of them just won't let you do that, period. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they don't like that. So they, they always keep your raw file too, uh, because always, you know, they may ask you and check your raw file. They go through a very strict process of checking. So when you see on the, the their website, actually, I saw, I've seen very beautiful photographs, much better than mine, you know, in the uh, editor's pick uh, before mm -hmm. the competition. Uh, but somehow they didn't make it to the final. So it could be uh, of some of these probably the reasons, you know, the raw file is too much different from the final image because of the corrections or the post-processing. So I'm not sure. Mm. Maybe, you know, there are other reasons they didn't get paid. But sometimes you don't know in a, in a competition, you, you don't know what the judges are looking for and what do they have in mind. So just, well, we just try our best, that's all. <laughs> Well, you, you, you've, you've got a wonderful entry in the event, and we all wish you the, the best of luck and to be even accepted into the pool of images is fantastic. To be in the, in the top 10 is like uh, utterly crazy good <laughs> yeah. beyond, you know, beyond, I think, what you would have uh, imagined. And, and I, like I said, I, I personally think it's the best one that's in that category right now. So uh, um, what, now when does it, uh, John thought it ends in April? Uh, is when is it? Yeah, uh, they didn't say when, uh, but they said that uh, usually in spring, uh, springtime. But if I look at the past announcement, usually it is in the first two weeks of April. Okay. Yeah. We've got, uh, I just, I just, uh, Rand, Randall, Rand just bought a SL. Any suggestions for him? Huh? Randall. He just bought a SL. SL3? Two S. Any suggestions? Oh, SL2S. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, Randall. This. Oh, oh, yeah. And then a 90, uh, what is it? A 90 to 80? 90 to 280. Oh, wow. That's heavy. <laughs> that one. <laughs> This this is the the same lens I use in um, uh, Mongolia uh, to shoot some of the eagle pictures. Uh, the SL two S. Uh, I haven't used this camera. I have the SL two, uh, which the uh, sensor size. Uh, no, I think it's yeah. higher megapixels. Uh, I eventually got rid of this camera because uh, they have an issue that they could not solve. Uh, which means uh, when I was shooting uh, high speed uh, continuous and the battery life is that, you know, if you only have half the battery, uh, meaning two bars in the battery, and it will not support a high speed continuous. So that was an issue with the SL2 I have, but I'm not sure about this SL2, SL2S. SL2S. Uh, but yeah, uh, I got the SL2S on a deal. So apparently uh, the man died. The daughter was cleaning out the shed and she didn't know what it was. So she took it to the camera store. They got money for it. She was happy. But 
I went to get the lenses. So I was just looking for the 24 to 70 to go with my Panasonic S5 II. And the way the salesman said was, well, um, we got another lens. And then you show me the, uh, well, I need a telephoto lens. So I'll take it. And then they showed me the camera. And uh, I got all three. So I saved about 2000 bucks. I, I paid for the, I think, 55000 for the 90 to 280, which was brand new in the box. Not even mm-hmm. open. Wow. And, uh, I don't know if that's a deal. But uh, I know that the 24 to 70, I got $1,000 off. And the um, the camera itself, I had $2,000 off of that. Oh, that's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 price. Yeah. that's a very good deal. I think when I paid for the 9280, I mean, like five years ago, I pay twenty seven thousand a year. What's that mean? About six. 6 I, I pay about six thousand uh, yeah. US dollars for that lens, brand new. So I found out that the Panasonic S one R H or S, was it? Is it the H? The one that's the movie. Um, uh. It's a lot cheaper than the Leica, but uh, I haven't owned a not Leica before, so I said, "Well, okay." Let me try it out. So I'm mm-hmm. putting it through the paces. As you can see, my videos have really increased after I'm finally done with the renovating of the house, or just about. But uh, I got, uh, I still use all different types of cameras. So I use my mm-hmm. ZFC today. Um, I use two different lenses. So I got videos up for that. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and I'm over 1,700 videos now. You know, wow. 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 Turning it out. It's trying to wow. break the uh you know break break the Guinness Book of World Records on video. <laughs> <laughs> or break YouTube, one or the other. Or break YouTube, yeah. Yeah, if YouTube crashes, Randall, we're all gonna blame you, you know. <laughs> I'm just I'm just letting you know. We're gonna point the finger at you. We're gonna say that's the guy that did it. <laughs> But yeah. but Diana, we are, we are happy that you're much better now. That you don't have any, you know, uh, more more scaring or any, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, it okay. it looks it looks good. It looks good. Uh, thank yeah, so you. I'll, I'll try not so how to long, say. How long ago was that you had the accident? We'll say, oh no, anymore tonight. <laughs> yeah. How long ago since you had the accident? Uh, that was in 2022, uh, August. So it's about a year ago. Okay. Yeah, about a year ago. Uh, so since then, I bought back the 907 uh, because, you know, it just, I, I spoiled it. So I said, okay, I work harder and then I made the money back and then I, I have to get it back because <laughs> it's something, yeah, it's something I don't know. Your heart feel, feel not nice because you destroyed the camera. I can't blame myself, uh, you know, for, for being careless. So I, ha- I had to do that. And after that, you know, I bought back the S2D. And that's why I swap with, um, uh, I swapped the Leica SL with the Hasselblad. Uh, for the Hasselblad, just now, Randall, you know, I, I also still keep my original, the first um, Leica SL type 601. And that particular camera is very nice. And I pair that with the Sigma lens, the Sigma l Mount. There's a Sigma L mount 150 to 600 lens, and it is so good. That lens is is very reasonably priced, and it gives you the range of 150 to 600, and it's just amazing. I, I have a quite a good sh- a lot of good shots, you know, from that lens. Another another lesson you could you could say is don't ever go in rice fields with John again. I know. Really? Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he, you know, she's so maven on, on trying to get this out. So she, she went up to the upper tier paddy field, you know, because they're on terraces. And I said, well, I'm not climbing up that thing. Right. So you wouldn't take the fall for your wife is what you're saying. Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, she, she just goes, she just goes maven on me, you know. <laughs> then when she's coming down, there she goes, right into that drain. Oh man, lock, stock, and barrel. That and was John missed the shot. 
That was yeah. the most expensive. <laughs> I couldn't but, believe it. But I but looked John, the and she's sitting in the irrigation ditch, you know. And I'm going, not, not, oh my God, you know. Yeah. I can't well, now, now we know why you have so much problem with the Hasselblad in your videos. <laughs> yeah. Broken. You don't like it anymore. Well, it, it definitely ain't waterproof. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what bleds are not very good outdoor cameras, are they? <laughs> well, you know the the, the thing is, it, it's it, is um, it's uh, it's a it's a latch, right? And it's not real. So this is this is one of the downfalls of the camera. It's 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 not secure because uh, all the, never was. there's these there's these two hinges you know that hook up on the bottom and then it clips on with the two little clips right and of course you knock it hard enough the whole thing's going to come off like of a course. you know but this is what they don't tell you exactly and, and for 8500 bucks you know hello there's there's more than you know for form over form over uh beauty here so you know this big old sensor who we're talking huge money here easy to clean though well this one is <laughs> definitely you can't clean but this this is the weak link you see yeah of course yeah is, is, is this clipping thing because this is this is the body of the camera. Yeah, it should it should have something right. that 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 like two latches that, that, where you where it goes yeah. in and then you have to turn it like like almost yeah. like a like a screw almost it goes in and then you turn it the, uh, and la and lock it. You the can see system the system had two latches. You can see the and latch, the second latch and on the you, side. And you see these two little uh these those, two hooks. Those little tangs yeah. are very thin. Yeah, they yeah, are yeah. too strong. Yeah. So, this is what's hooking up to your eight thousand dollar camera. Now come yeah. on, and then well, uh, and then you attach a, a heavy lens. Then it's I, it right is. exactly, and that's not even including that. I mean, those lenses are so. Anyway, wow, yeah. That's why I say my video. You know, I know you guys. I get it that you like it because it's beautiful, but the caveat is, you know. It's up to you. Use right? this in studio. Don't take it out. Yeah, if you do it in the studio. Use it in studio. But handheld street shots, forget about it. You know. And then when you when you stick out the viewfind, this L C D, if it's so bright outside, well you can't see it. Because yeah, it's, it's indoor it's, camera. You know, yeah, and, and then and then the the lens have have no numbers. Right, so you can't tell if you're infinity or you're up close. <laughs> wow, it just spins. So it's it's extremely um, not very practical. Well, you know, that's for sure. It's it's beautiful. Yeah, but you get better images, off. Right? Uh, the yeah. images is beautiful. I mean, that's no doubt about that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But the height but system Randy, is a good, catch. good deal, man. Well, once again, congratulations to you, and uh, we're all rooting for you. We hope you uh, can be next time you come on, you have like a number one above your head because oh, you were number one. It. Let's hope, let's yeah. hope you that yeah, you're number one. And, and, and James was asking that if you win, do you have to come to Washington, D.C. to receive your award? <laughs> Oh, I mean, like if if they do have a award ceremony, I really don't know the details, but I would love to. I mean, if there's a chance, you know, I would like to see the museum. Uh, I have never seen it before. I've never been to Washington, uh, so I'd like to come and visit one day. Yeah, to see what it is like, you know. It will take you a couple of days. Wow, really? That big? Yeah, there's a lot there to see. I mean, I I went there on a weekend one time when I was on a business trip and I had the weekend free and I, I took the little tram to go from Maryland over to DC. And, and that was the first time I ever went in the Smithsonian museum. And, and there's a lot of different buildings. It's not just in one, one, you know, like one little building it's, it sprawls out everywhere. And I only, I only saw a very, very, very small little piece of it. And it was just, I mean, the public, you know, and because and I worked in the, 
Now, because I worked on space hardware, I went to where they had, you know, the space related yeah, memorabilia and whatnot. Uh, yeah. But it's you, you could easily you could be there for a week and you're not going to see everything. And there's a lot of photo opportunities. I mean, you would love it. You would really like it. And it's very and I was shocked. I hadn't been there since I was a little kid. I didn't like it when I was a little kid. When I went there probably 10 years ago, like I said, on a business trip, I was surprised how clean it was there. I thought Washington was going to be grungy and dirty and everything. And mm -hmm. I got off that, um, you know, the uh, tram or whatever they call it and 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 get went up the stairs and I'm on the main street there. And I didn't see any garbage on the ground anywhere. It was so clean. It was amazing. I was shocked. Not what I thought it was going to be. But John, yeah, my dad. You, live, you live in Washington at one point with your dad, correct? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. That's the last time I was at the Smithsonian with with my my old man took me there to the uh, Smithsonian Museum of uh, you know science and uh, the space science the space and technology, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. They had uh, what you know what's his name the the Wright brothers airplane. All the Apollo. Uh, uh, yeah, the Apollo Mercury thing. capsules and all that stuff. Yeah, because I, I lived in D.C. during the 60s, mm. you know, so I haven't been back. My sister's my sister lives there now. But it'd be great to take Diana because I told her, hey, this Smithsonian is no schlep deal, man. This is this is <laughs> exactly. Mount Everest. This is this is this. Yeah. This is it. It's you can't get museum. higher than this. You know, this is where they keep the. The, you know, Mona Lisa and the uh, Hope Diamond. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very proud of her. Yes, yes. I only have pictures of dead guys. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. How'd you get their um, release? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, what'd you do? Put a pen in their hand and like move their hand for them or what? <laughs> Yeah, I need a model release. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> right, is Superazzi coming? Uh, I think he's having technical difficulties. He is. So okay, yeah, because thank you guys. Thank you for thank thank you very much for supporting. No, I thank, really thank you, that. thank you. That's the one. Diana. I, I yeah. know you also are a scuba diver. Scuba is going to talk about scuba diving and, you know, photography. Yeah, scuba. he's having a lot of problems where his oh. um, his webcam is not. He oh, doesn't oh, have a he doesn't have a camera to yeah. hook up, and his webcam isn't Good working. Show. And uh, so he's oh. having some issues. So, oh, yeah. well, worst ca worst yeah. case, scuba Razi, you know. You know, try a few things, and if it doesn't work, we'll just put it off till next week. We 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 can move on to other topics. Um, don't uh, don't drive yourself crazy. Yeah, I can do it without so, the webcam. So I think he wants to do it without the the webcam. Uh -huh. he can, yeah, he thinks it's free channel work. So. Yeah, whatever you want to do is fine. Whatever you want to do is fine. Yeah, I was having problems today also, so I don't know if it's updates. Uh, you heard the echo in the microphone. So. Uh, yeah, I had the same uh, on my iMac. That's why I switched to the uh, MacBook. Yeah. But, but the question for Kubarasi, can you narrate the presentation or? Yeah, if your presentation is like saying, uh... Well, let's see. I don't have a. I have a Mac, so it probably wouldn't work. It would work through me because uh, if it's uh, PowerPoint, I don't think I'd be able to share it. Um, the Squares, do you have audio? Well, if you if you what you could do, Scubarazzi, is is because you you are technically here on the show, even though we don't see you. Uh, you can just go on the share screen on your, uh, you know, to go on share screen and, cl and click the presentation and I'll be able to open it up and show it to everybody. And then as long as you have audio, you can narrate and go through it and it'll show up. Everybody will be able to see it. 
So I don't I don't know if you follow along with what I just said, but if you go like you got you look at the bottom of your restream, you got the mute, you got the microphone on the left, and you got the camera, and then the next one is share screen. So you make sure that you have your presentation open on your desktop, go to share screen, and then you click. You'll have three categories, Chrome tab, window, and entire screen. So you click on window, and then you select you select your presentation, and it should show up on the screen here, and we'll be able to, and then you could talk to it. Okay. He's saying that the mic doesn't work. <laughs> He's doing well, isn't he? Well, if you, if you, if you, I, I think at this point, if you want, it's, is to just table it for a week and, and we'll try again next week if you are available. I don't, I don't want you to get, um, feel too stressed here about it because uh, life goes on, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'll cry myself to sleep tonight because I didn't get to see it, but, uh, you know, we could, we could do it next week. <laughs> In the meantime, while you're while you're fooling around, I'll see if we have any other things here to uh, that I can uh, bring up. Um, dun, 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 give me a second, folks. Um, okay, let's see. Give me a second. I'm not going to talk about the firmware yet. Um, <laughs> let's see. Okay. Uh, and Nikon NX studio is now version 1.61 for those of you who use NX studio and Roy's favorite program. I got to say it. Roy's favorite program snap bridge is now version 2.11.0. I believe it's getting better though. <laughs> so as they say, uh, be, yes. there, be there or be square. Make sure you update that. The, yes. Try again, yeah, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good Sorry, morning. I had to change the headset. Somehow the headset didn't work as well. Um, so that's better. Oh, that's fine. Good. So, good morning, everyone. Just Miss Diana was impressing, as always. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, how should we proceed? Should I try to share my screen? Um, yeah, I'm yeah, share your prepared, screen. Yes. Prepare yeah. the presentation. Um, let me see, maybe it works. Yeah, open up the presentation first so it's in the back, so you have it open in the background, and then yeah. click on the share screen button, and then you want to click on the uh, top, it'll you'll have a choice to click on window, so you want to click on the window. And it'll show everything, every file or anything that you have open on your desktop will show up. So you then just click on your presentation and and we'll be able to see it. Okie doke. Theoretically, you know, this is this is technology. <laughs> okay, can you do you have to share it? Oh, uh, yes. Yep. You're, it's going to be on the screen. Uh, screen. Here we are. Right. Here we go. Very good. So let me, I am going to make the screen bigger and I'll just let everybody know that when I do this, I cannot see anybody's comments in the chat. So uh -huh. don't feel, don't take it personal if I'm ignoring you. But when I do this on my computer, I'm not going to see anything in the chat. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, and, and we, we keep we, we keep an eye on that. And Kuarasi, if you can and if you want, do a little bit of an intro on yourself as well. Yes, uh, if you don't mind revealing your real name, unless mm -hmm. unless it's a top secret agency you work for, uh, mm -hmm. feel free to just give us a little little bit of information about yourself and 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 what got you and what type of photography you like to take. Because I know you take more than just underwater shots. Sure. Um, so, my name is Paul, um, I'm based in Switzerland, um, yeah, from photo perspective, I started up, yeah, 
doing really pictures in 2006, more or less. Before of that, I didn't have too much time and I didn't have the budget to do so. Um, yeah, as you see, my favorite um, genre of photography is basically underwater photography, but um, I cannot do it all the time. So I have to do other stuff. So one thing I do a lot as well is animals, um, birds, because uh, of the nature of it, because we have a lot of birds here and not a lot of other animals. So if I would be somewhere in Namibia, maybe I would do lions or something, but here I do birds in the last few years, especially falcons. But I also try to do pictures of um, other stuff. So as you have probably already seen in the in the photo reviews, I try to play around with different techniques, macro, um, especially with a lot of gadgets that I got from somewhere, like um, special triggers or the water droplets or smoke, you name it. Um, so that's basically more or less about me. Um, yeah, about the presentation, um, I was in contact with with Jeff for a while, and he asked me to do a presentation of um, um, for of underwater photography. So here I prepared a little bit something. Um, so I will give you a little intro about what is underwater water photography about. Um, We'll talk about dive gear. So this is probably the most interesting thing for you all, as I assume. I talk a little bit about physics. Um, the most important thing, cameras, of course. Um, then we'll talk about housings, because just having a camera doesn't work by itself underwater. You need some more stuff. We talk about lights, um, then optical lenses, other accessories. Um, then I will drop a few words about uh, maintenance and post-processing. That is also a very important thing. Then I will share quickly what gear I used before and what gear I'm using now so that you have an idea um, how much stuff comes into it um, yeah and then I will do some show and tell I will show you some picture I did uh, give you some insights about how I shot them um, what may be special on them what challenges I have or I had what could be done better so all of them are far away from from being perfect or sometimes even good but uh, i added them to the to the presentation just to give you an idea what what issues one can have good um so let's start with what you need for underwater photography um so most important thing for underwater photography or scuba photography is um, you need to be an experien experienced scuba diver so it doesn't work if you just start up and you take your camera underwater and you really have to know your gear you have to know the drill um, because already scuba diving and few of the people in the the panel can confirm that uh, you're really busy with the gear uh, with not drowning <laughs> So you don't want to mess around with with a camera if you're not ready for that. Something what you also need to have is perfect buoyancy, um, because we always see people having cameras underwater, no matter if it's GoPros or big stuff that don't mm. control their buoyancy well, and they crash into the reef, they break everything, they destroy the reefs for nothing and nothing and it also doesn't give you very good pictures if you don't have that also important as i said you need to know your dive gear inside out it has to be like second nature um, because if you have a camera in your hand and you have to think about what button you have to press to get air or to go up or down it just wouldn't work 
of course, you need a certain amount of photography skills. Um, clear the cameras nowadays in auto, they make already decent pictures, but um, you only get to a certain level with that, not above. Also here, uh, you have to know your photo gear inside out because um, even though the cameras, you can really handle everything perfectly and um, use all the functions that you have on your camera. Um, you do not see all the buttons. They, they are not always labeled. So you really need to know what button to tur uh, press to get this function or what wheel to turn to open or close the aperture and so on. Then what you also need is a lot of patience, uh, like always in photography. You have to be a little bit of a masochist because um, yeah. Yeah, you have a lot of gear and a lot of stuff hanging around and it's heavy. And what you also have to be a little bit of antisocial because um, underwater photographers are some of them are not very good bodies because um, as some of you may know uh, one dives all uh, you always dive in a team yeah. at least two people together to look out for each other and um, it's not always um, very easy to keep an eye on your body but it's very important um, and also if you try to take a picture of something then your body has to wait all the time so um, then we come, of course, to the next important thing. You, you need to have a good dive body. I always say I see on my pictures who da uh, dove with me, who was my body, because I have a few bodies that are really good, um, that know me inside out. I know where they are. I, um, I don't have to search for them all the time because I know they are on this position and I don't have to look every 10 seconds for them because I know they're really good scuba divers and I can even use them as sort of a model to fill the picture with with a scuba diver. And on the other side, sometimes you have a you have a body that is not experienced, but that is all over the place. And then um, the quality of my pictures because I do not have the time to take them is way worse. Yeah, of course, then you need the underwater photo gear. Um, without a photo, without photo gear, you cannot take pictures, right? Um, and something that that may be useful, especially for beginners, is um, to consider to do education. Um, there is the so-called digital underwater photographer by the dive associations like PEDI or SSI, where you can go to a more or less experienced um, instructor and he will teach you the basics of photography. And if you have a really good one, he knows um, if he has to teach you the art of photography underwater or how to properly dive in order to take good pictures like buoyancy and stuff like this. So, um, yeah, a topic that Jeff asked me also for is um, to mention, um, besides of scuba diving, what I'm doing also the snorkeling aspect. So let's make the difference a little bit between scuba diving photography and snorkeling photography. So as you know, in snorkeling, you're moving only on in the on the top level of the water column. So between um, zero and five meters or zero to 15 feet. Um, that makes gives you simpler gear um, because you don't, do not need a lot of stuff to do this sort of photography. You do not need a expensive housing that, uh, that holds big pressures. You do not need a lot of lights um, because you're moving on the top level of the water where there is a lot of light during the day. Um, but on the other side, of course, um, you have, it's harder to make a proper image composition because it feels like you always take a picture from the top. Uh, maybe you, you snorkel down a little bit, uh, but you do not have the time to wait for something to do. 
And of course, the, uh, the biodiversity on the top is different and below you're more flexible if you're a scuba diver and you can move. Scuba diving, of course, um, you move in totally different areas. You move between the water surface and 40 meter as a regular scuba diver. Of course, there are some people that are specialized to that dive deeper. We have seen all the, the documentaries with Jacques Cousteau and so on, when they go even deeper with special gear, but don't talk about that. You have a lot of gear. Um, you require to have a housing. You, you probably will have lenses. You most likely will have some sort of light with you. Um, because, of course, uh, we will see later on in the physics how the light uh, changes with that. Um, but on the other hand, of course, you can do a way better uh, image composition. So you can go down, you can get closer to your subject, you can shoot from below, uh, you can wait for a while till an animal is doing some sort of action and so on. And of course, due to the bigger three-dimensional area or you have better chance to to find more animals or better corals or whatever or wrecks whatever good uh, let's go quickly to the dive here so as i said um, as a regular underwater photographer you do not carry only your camera like i do when i go for to take some pictures of birds where i have my camera my lens maybe a second lens and tripod and the backpack now first of all we need to dive so you see what everything is needed um, so what we have um, is uh, give me a second can we see the pointer yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah so so of course depending on where you dive you have a wetsuit um, we in switzerland even have dry suits they are even more chunky um, then you have uh, this uh, BCD, so-called BCD, so it's a, or called jacket, where you have um, where you connect all your stuff, so your your dive tank, um, all the hoses that you have, but you also normally clip on the camera to it so that you don't lose it in case that you would need both hands to do something. Um, then, of course, here you have a lot of additional weight because you need weight to go down so when i scuba dive um, only my gear it depends if it's salt or fresh water but let's talk about uh, 40 kilograms additional gears plus five to seven kilograms photo gear so we're quickly around 50 kilograms that i carry around that makes like i don't know 100 pounds it's quite a lot especially for some people it uh, may double their their weight good um quickly physics i know physics is boring um, but just to give you a slight idea i don't want will not talk about numbers and stuff like this it's just stuff that people need to be aware of. so first of all you need to be aware of the pressure of the water so the deeper you go the the more pressure is um affecting you and your dive gear as well um, so you need uh, to have a good housing for your gear um, then be, of, be aware of the buoyancy underwater so one thing is um, the buoyancy of yourself the other thing is also the buoyancy of your camera gear so a lot of people or a lot of divers have um, their camera added with floats so that the camera is in every position underwater is behaving neutrally so it swims it doesn't go down it doesn't go up uh, my camera is a little bit um, heavy underwater so it goes down if i leave it alone uh, because it's really hard to to make my camera uh, buoyant as i would like to it to be um, then something that is really important is be aware of the temperature. In this case, especially the humidity. Um, what one forgets is um, if you're somewhere where it's warm, let's talk Bali, 
Um, you have a lot of uh, humidity outside. You have 30 degrees centigrade. And when you go scuba diving, you have this humidity in your housing. And then underwater, the water is colder, even though it's just a little. Um, then sometimes the water con condensates on the, um, how it's called, the front of the camera. So suddenly you cannot see anything through. So it's a little bit like if you're in, in inside the AC building and with your camera and you go out in Singapore and you try to take pictures also, then it's not that easy. Yeah, your lens fogs up. You can't see anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it it depends a lot on the on the housing that you have. Um, metal housing there, it condensates more on the metal part of the housing. If you have a acrylic housing or a plastic housing, then mostly it condensates on the uh, on the glass. Then what is also very important on the water is um, density of the water and the visibility. So because water is way more denser, you do not see so far on the water as uh, above water. So it's a little bit like foggy, um, but it feels a little different. And of course, it depends a lot of about um, what uh, what you have in the water. So is there plankton in the water? Is there dirt in the water? And so on. So in Switzerland, um, if it's really bad, uh, we can have visibilities for to up to three feet, one meter, uh, what is really nothing. So it feels really like in a confined dark room. And on the other side, we have mountain rivers and mountain lakes. You will see pictures there. We have visibilities of 50 meters and so on. So it really depends on what you have. But you cannot, normally you cannot use zoom lenses on the water. So you cannot put your 600 F4 on the, your underwater camera because <laughs> it kind of doesn't make sense. Can you, uh, can you just uh, make a comment about how, um, how your, your human eye perceives the size of things when you're underwater because it's completely different? Exactly. That's the next point. So underwater, everything um, looks bigger. Uh, so if you're underwater, everything looks like 50% bigger than it actually is. And this has to do with um, the light refraction. Um, so, so this is also a little bit the effect. If you put uh, a spoon into a glass of water, you will also see one thing that is uh, the spoon isn't straight or it seems not to be straight suddenly and underwater everything is bigger so you have to get used to it so in the people who start scuba diving um, they sometimes if they try to hold on on something or so they they do not get it at the, at the first time uh, for for underwater pictures the the effect of everything being a little bit bigger isn't so much relevant because your brain compensates it and you the picture is basically the same as as what your brain and your eyes tell you good then something that is really important underwater is um, you need to be aware of light and color so the deeper you go the less color you have and also uh, the less light you have and also less color you have so water is filtering out um, colors very well so what you see here is that in the first uh, 30 feet 10 meters you lose quite a lot of the, the reddish and orange colors then till 18 meters you still see a little bit of yellow and purple then further down you have you start to lose the green colors and then you have just the blue and you will see it on the pictures how it looks so um, what we as scuba divers need to do is basically we need to re-add the color otherwise everything is blue and gray if we dive a little deeper and this can be done basically in with through three ways um, one of them is we add red filters 
Um, this is something that mostly is done by people who are making videos underwater, not only filming, but mainly videos. The other one is we can do a auto white, white balance. You know it from your camera where you can change the white balance to artificial light or cloudy light. So we can do auto white balance, but I do not like to do that too much um, because it's just it adds a little bit something, but it's nothing you couldn't do in post as well with Photoshop or so. Um, what I use is, of course, lights. So I bring two strobes um, and that's adding me some color, but we'll see more in the example pictures. Good. Now the probably most interest, interesting part for the um, for the gear heads here. So you see um, there is a, it's not my gear, as the, I took the pictures uh, from the housing um, uh, producer, Nauticam, and the other one for the, from the strobe producer, Inon, uh, or Inon, however they're called. Um, you see there is a lot of different uh, housings and lightings and so on. Um, so the guy with the many strobes may be a little bit extreme. I haven't seen that so far, <laughs> but it looks impressive. Good. So let's start with cameras. Um, so the most simple way for a camera for underwater is, um, of course, action cams. So we can go from GoPro or at the Insta or DJI versions of the action cam. Um, so what I use personally, I use a GoPro and I use this Insta DAS360. Um, the left one, is it left? Yeah, it is. Um, the left one to do 360 shots or maybe vid mostly videos. So I have them as a plan B camera mostly. The nice thing is those cameras are waterproof till five to 10 meters, depending on which one you have. You do not need even housing. They are simple. Um, they do the job to a certain amount, but of course are not perfect. But they got quite a long way since I used my first GoPro one on the water that was not even focusing, but nowadays they are quite okay. Um, another thing what you can do is you can take um, your uh, mobile phone on the water. Um, some of the phones, not directly the cell phone here, but others like the iPhone or so, they are even waterproof to a certain amount. So you can take them without the housing, but we'll see. There are also housings. Another option is our cameras that are already waterproof by themselves. So we have like this Kodak one. Yes, Kodak still makes seems to make cameras and that is waterproof to 50 meters or 50 feet. Uh, we have, I know that Nikon had a one as well. I didn't find the current picture of it. And on the left side, we have cameras from Sea Life. Sea Life is are specialized for underwater cameras. Those cameras can really get deep. So this one, for example, gets down to 60 meters or 200 feet. The nice thing about them is they're basically sealed. So the, the memory card and everything is inside, the battery is inside. You just charge it by a little um, charging port and you get the cameras. As you, what you also see, this camera is basically four buttons. It has just the release button you have the one to switch from between video photo um, you can review your pictures and you have a menu with a few things so this camera is really well built for underwater photography for easy use so it's nothing if you have higher expectations but you can if you're a beginner you start up and you don't want to you want to take some decent pictures um, you can do that with such a camera. Yeah, and just and just because it's rated for 200 feet doesn't mean that you should try to go 200 feet because mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. The so will hold up much better than you will. <laughs> especially, I think that people who who, re, who dive with um, with such a camera, they are normally not rated 
or not train for 200 feet but it's absolutely uh, true. as always we it's like with with driving a car there is always people who have the have the idea that they are on the highway they can drive twice as fast as they can and they feel like michael schumacher or somebody even though they are not <laughs> yeah then the next cameras um this is basically what i'm using is um point and shoot cameras um they had so what I use, I use a, so currently I use a Sony RX100 VA or 5A um, before I use the Canon. Um, Nikon is not doing currently any known camera for for point and shoot for underwater. Um, or they're not very known at the moment to do point and shoots for underwater. Um, the advantages of the small cameras are, of course, they're small, they're handy. Also, the housing is smaller. They are way cheaper than the big ones. Uh, of course, you have these advantages. Um, the small sensor uh, is a challenge, um, so the quality is not so good. For me, though, the biggest challenge is um, the reaction time, so the, the time before it focuses and it can take the next picture again and also for the stroke to reload so this is for me a little bit the biggest disadvantage or trade-off that i have for uh, compared to big cameras but if you're a big boy you have a lot of money and um, you don't know what to do you can also take the big cameras underwater and it doesn't really matter if it's a if it's a small DSLR or a small um, mirrorless, or if it's a uh, Z9 or so, there are really housings for for those big cameras as well, um, as you will see. But of course, here as well, uh, you have all the advantages of, of the big cameras. Um, you, but on the other side, you have disadvantages like that. That the things are they are really heavy. The housings are expensive. Um, it sounds stupid, but you're less flexible with the lenses because before the dive, you decide what lens you put on your camera and then you go underwater with it. Uh, with the other solutions, with the point and shoot, you can basically um, switch lenses underwater because the lenses are so called wet lenses. But I will come to that. Good. So as i said if you do scuba diving or snorkeling then a housing is maybe useful so what i do the gopro wouldn't survive the 30 40 meter depth so we have a housing um you get them from the from the the manufacturer of the camera uh, something what you see here is um the filters so you can have already filters for the gopro you see yeah. there is different colors and the, the reason why you can have different colors is on one side depending on the depth where you go so the deeper you go the darker the red has to be and um, you see also a difference between the orange or red one and the magenta one here that depends if you're diving into in fresh water or or salt water yeah. um, Fresh water is kind of greenish mostly. Um, salt water is bluish. This has to do with the, the, the breaking of the light and with the particles that are in the water. So if we dive like in Switzerland, we take the magenta filter. If we dive, dive in Egypt, we take the red filter. Even here for the Insta360, they have a housing um, that they make. Um, for me, the housing, what is a little bit annoying, it fogs up quite quickly. I always have problem with fogging, fogging housing. Then for the mobile housing, um, it's, it's a trend that is coming up more and more. I know a friend of mine had a mo uh, housing for his mobile a few years ago. <sighs> he did his first dive. It was expensive because he had to buy a new mobile phone and the housing leaked and mobile phone was gone so um yeah me personally i wouldn't take my mobile phone underwater because it's somehow it's a little bit too 
yeah, precious. But nowadays, as you see, um, there are several manufacturers that build housings. Um, so on the left side, we have like C Sea Life. The, pr the price is around three hundred fifty dollars. Um, I'm not sure if you have a special photo app for it, but you see, you have um, you can uh, put it in. It's uh, pressure sealed. You can take your pictures, do some adjustments, and so on and so forth. The right one is Oshie from Oceanic. It's a pretty new one. I had it in my hands two months ago, which was in the dry. I didn't dive with it. Um, what is special on this one is on the one side, you see that down here, um, it has a vacuum pump in it. So you can make an under pressure in the housing um, to see if it's leaking or not. I will talk about this a little bit more later on what it is. And the other thing is you can um, really operate your mobile phone on the touch screen. So the housing has some special membrane in front of it that doesn't, that withholds the pressure on the water, but doesn't break. Um, and allows you to touch the or operate the mobile phone by touch. Wow. Then we go to the point and shoot housing. So mainly there is uh, two sorts of dye, uh, housing. There's plastic ones. Um, here we talk price wise a um, little bit cheaper than the camera itself mostly. Um, but you see um, this one is from iClight. They are specialized for, for plastic housings. Um, they are really good. Um, you can operate the camera fully most of the time. Maybe there, there are some cameras that you can't, but most of the cameras you can operate fully, even the all the wheels you have. Um, some of the manu camera manufacturers, they do their own housings. I know that Olympus used to do that. I don't know if they still do. Nikon used to do that, but they stopped. Um, I don't know how about the others, maybe Canon as well. The other thing what you can have is then aluminum housing. This is basically the housing I have. Um, so it's more sturdy. Also here, what you have is um, you can operate it fully. So you see you have here in the front, you have a, uh, a wheel that can operate the wheel around the lens. Um, you have um, you have here a wheel that is operating, a wheel that is on the back of the camera where you can uh, change your aperture or your um, your exposure time. And you see most of the buttons are labeled. So this is really nice. But we're back again to what I said before, know your camera inside out because sometimes on the water, if it's a little darker or so, you do not see the labels here. So you have to know what is where. Um, just, yeah? wow. I just want to throw something in here on, on uh, I don't know if you can back up one uh, sure. to your previous slide or not. So I'm assuming that I mean, I obviously, I lived in New England and we would be diving in many times very, very cold water and we weren't even able to wear dive gloves. We had to wear divers mitts. So mm -hmm. obviously the thing is uh, you have to be aware of where you plan on, what is the environment in which you're diving in and which you want to take pictures in. Obviously, if you're in the Caribbean, you have a housing like you're showing that your housing on the, in the bottom right picture. Those buttons are not huge. So if you have don't have to wear gloves, that's pretty convenient. You can just push it with your bare fingers and that's fine. But if you got to wear mitts, then uh, certain housings may not work for you because you don't have the dexterity. <laughs> yeah, th this is a very good point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we when we dive here and it's cold we dive with dry suits we have special dry gloves they're really chunky they're they're, they're not mittens um, they have all the fingers but as you said it's really hard to to hit the right um the right button underwater so what i really do i try 
especially when I dive in cold water to to set up my camera as good as possible and then I try only to change if needed the aperture or the, the exposure time if possible. I mostly shoot auto ISO anyway. Um, sometimes I have to review my pictures, but I try not to mess around too much. But in warm waters, it's easier, then you can operate it well. But, uh, but this is a very good point, Jeff. Right. Good. Um, then to the big boys. Um, also from iClight and um, Nauticam, they also do big cameras. So both of them, uh, those housing are housings are for the Z8. As you see here as well, they mostly already come with uh, with some grips to hold the camera. Um, they are really big, really chunky, really heavy. So if you go on vacation. Uh, with this, you're already overweight and you didn't even bring um, underpants with you. So <laughs> that's uh, one of the reasons why not to dive it. On the other side, it's also so big that with with gear like this, um, you're also really bad body because you, you bring so much gear that you have to handle, that you're concentrated on the gear and not on, on your surrounding too much. Um, Something what we see here is um, you see around this part, uh, there is something missing. So it's here. Um, the reason is, we'll come to that later, is um, the housings before, they are already integrated. They are sealed as they are. And they have the, the front um, already for the lens that is there. But here you need to do depending on what lens you put on your camera if it's like a 105 millimeter macro or a wide angle or so you have to put a different port on it in the front and you buy it as well so the housing as you see it here it's not even waterproof so there is still something missing and we'll come to that later on so ah yeah the, then something else, what you need underwater is light. And there is basically two sorts of lights. Uh, you have constant lights. And those are a few of them. And so we have people who, like me, uh, I have a constant light and two strobes. The constant light I have to, when it's dark, just to pre-focus or to, to search for something. Other people, they are using constant lights instead of strobes, or they're shining all the times. And you, those lights are really big, and they can get really expensive. So you see um, regular lights um, are between 250 and $1,000 each. Um, you can operate them in um, with the density. Most of them have a certain warmth uh, of light, like you have. Also with your regular lights at home, so some some of the LEDs are are um, warmer, some of them are colder, and um, yeah, then you have the really big boys like this one from the company Keldon. They are really really bright and really expensive, but this is the stuff that um, then if you have documentaries um, from National Geographic or so, those guys use very often lights like this, and they are really really nice but expensive talking about strobes so the red one is what i use or it's a new model of what i use and so also here um, you need a lot of a lot of light for the strobes um, the price point is between 1000 and 1500 dollars um, there is two ways to trigger them um, one way it's you see it down here is optically so your camera is having a strobe and the strobe um, uses the basically the slave system to uh, your camera strobe triggers then the external strobe the other one is you can do it electrically so you have a cable connected to your housing connected to your hot shoe of your camera and the, the camera is triggered that way so most of the time the, the small cameras point to shoot they use the the optical trigger the other ones use the other trigger 
as you see uh, as well down here um, you can configure the, the the strokes to be automatic or TTL and you can configure them to be manual so I hi Joey um, hey how's it going <laughs> good hey Joe. So, that's basically about the light. So I, I normally take two strokes. Um, a, because I need a lot of light and B, it gives the better lighting if you, you have light from two sides. Um, basically the same rule supply as above water, right? Good. Now, um, as I mentioned before, for the housing, for the DSLR or mirrorless cameras, uh, we need ports. So you see you have um, here adapter rings that you put on it depending on how big the lens is that you put on and for macro lenses you have a flat port here so if you have a big 105 millimeter macro lens you may add one of those rings here and then the flat port in front if you have a wide angle or a fisheye you add a port like this in front of the camera or in front of the housing the prices is they can also get really, really big. So talking about $500 for stuff like this down here. And if you go on really nice wide angle ports, uh, you can easily pay $4,500. And if you think that uh, you buy something like this and then you, you have a, a housing for your Ari or your red camera that it's costing like, the price like a small car, uh, then it gets really <laughs> expensive really quickly. And now what, and now what lens do you find yourself using most often? Is it a, a you know, like a, a 35 millimeter lens, something of that, that range? Or are you, are you using, uh, how often do you, are you using macro lenses more often? Yeah, so, so as I said, I'm not using DSLRs underwater. Um, for me, the motivation is basically I'm way more fl flexible because I go into the water and I don't have to think about will I shoot a pygmy seahorse or would I, will I shoot a whale shark because I can switch my lenses. We will see the next lenses that we have. friend of mine who is shooting, um, uh, shooting DSLRs, he has really, before he goes to, into the water, he has to know, do I want to shoot macro now or wide angle? And macro, mostly it's 105 millimeter uh, macro lens. So basically the same one that we use above water, right? Underwater, they tend to use stuff like 20 millimeter, um, 20 millimeters wide angle sometimes they have zoom lenses to a certain degree few people shoot even 50 mil uh, it really depends what you want but yeah. yeah the problem is you you take the lens with or you decide before the that what you want to shoot and what we already had i was having with my friend where at the, on the philippines he put the macro lens on it and then he had a big turtle yeah, he could shoot the eye of the turtle and I could <laughs> before shoot the little critters and switch my lens on the water and then shoot the, the turtle in full its full beauty, not only the eye. And that's what I have what what I have is um wet optics. So those are lenses that you can put on the housing underwater. So either you screw them with a, there is a screw mechanism, uh, like a, a regular screw, or there is, um, I don't know how it's called in, in English, but there is one that you don't have to turn a lot. It's like bayonet mechanism where you put it on, you, you do a quarter of a twist and then it's holding. Yeah. And these are white, this one is a white angle lens underwater so you have your regular point and shoot camera and with the wide angle lens it automatically makes you a bigger angle something that is a little special is this one this is a wide angle or fisheye macro lens so you can get really close to something and it it uh, makes you this cool effect um it's a very expensive lens and uh, yeah 
there is not a lot of pictures to be taken with it, so it's more like a niche lens for there. So how, the how do you get rid of the, I mean, when you change on the water, how do you get rid of any water that may come between your camera body and your and your lens? There is like a perch uh, system? No, that, you know, the housing, the housing is basically sealed and you have, you have the, in front, you have the window where you're shooting through and you just put the lens in front of it. So you have like glass on glass oh, okay. with a little bit of water in between in okay. this case. So the housing is still sealed. Uh, you have it pressure sealed all the time and you just put like a filter. It's basically like a, you would put an external filter on it. Okay, That's okay. How it so, works. Exactly. so it's like a, it's it's like a sh shooting through a glass window. Yeah, exactly. And okay. and the great thing about it, so so let me go back to the housing. So you see here in front you have the the housing that is open. And if you would look very well, you would could see here there is a screw mount where you can put your lens on it. So it's like okay put in front of it. Beautiful. Um, same we have with macro lenses. Um, here you can see this um, the screw mount. So they are a little cheaper and there's different sorts of macro lenses um, can also be removed underwater. So what I can do is uh, when I go shooting, I take my camera, I have uh, both lenses with me. Uh, I shoot without a lens i can put the macro lens on it to shoot something very small and in five minutes later i can shoot the whale shark with uh, with the wide angle lens and this gives me a really good flexibility what i like that's also one of the reasons why i do not shoot dslr underwater but i shoot um i shoot uh, point and shoot cameras so so let me ask you a question here so, uh, I mean, how do you carry all this? Because I mean, you have like a back, a camera bag that is also on the water <laughs> to get all your lenses. Yeah. So, so mostly, mostly it's that I start diving with my wide angle lens on the housing. Okay. So I have that, and if I'm shooting without the wide angle, I take it off and I can hold it in one of my hands. Uh, when I hold the camera, the macro lens I have mostly I have a side pocket on my uh, wetsuit. Okay. On the side, so on one side I have a spare mask, and on the other side I have the the macro lens that I have uh, in there. And the the fish eye I have a little rope on it, so I can connect it. Uh, with a bolt strap to my um, to my gear, so that I don't lose it if I would have to wow. leave it leave it go. Yeah, yeah. There is a lot of um, <laughs> wires and stuff it, it, that like I it. have. So uh, the risk of drowning because of uh, struggling oneself is quite big. <laughs> yeah. Then there is a lot of other gear that we have. So I put it all on one picture. So as I said, we have um, we have the filters here. As we see, we have the salt water and the fresh water filter. Um, we often have a ground plate. That's the big thing up here. Um, on that one, we can put the strobes on. So we connect the strobes to the housing using that ground plate. Um, so they have this ball here that can be then connected with, um, I don't even know how it's called, those parts down here. So you have, you connect this part here to the ball here and to the arm of the, uh, of the strobe. Some people, when they do macro, they even have um, the legs as a tripod. So this is basically the setup that would we would have here, but I have never done that. Um, mm -hmm. I've never used a tripod underwater, but I know that people, some people do, um, especially for filming. Then a very important thing is the the strobe or light arms. So we have this one that is um, aluminium, 
uh, we have those two that are um, carbon fiber. The reason why they're big like this is um, they float. So they compensate the weight of the, the strobe on and the camera housing on the water. So you can, um, you can reduce the weight. Then something we also have or I have is uh, this here. This is, uh, this is an optical cable, uh, optical fiber cable. It connects my camera housing or the strobe from my camera housing with the strobe outside. So when my camera, the flash is triggered, it triggers also the, the external strobes. This is something that is also really special, at least for my housing. This is um, together with this pump, I can make a vacuum in my, or not, it's not a full vacuum, it's a sub pressure in my housing um, so that I would see if I have a leakage already above water. Um, wow. In the past, so talking 10, 20 years ago, only the very, very professional guys had this, so National Geographic, IMAX, and so on, because they have a, had, of course, the big and expensive cameras. Nowadays, you can already get it for, for mid-range housings. And this is really good. It gives, this gives one a good feeling. So you would make an under pressure in the housing, and if the pressure would um, increase again, then there is a sensor that would tell me. And basically, the sensor is that what you see here, can buy it separately. Yeah. So the sensor is uh, for pressure changes and humidity. So if water would get in, it would also start to blink and make noises so that you know to, to stop your dive. And you keep it under pressure or over pressure? Under pressure. Yeah. Oh, under pressure. Very good. Yeah, because you know, um, when, when you have a housing that doesn't have that, the most of the time when you have a leakage, your housing will fill up in the first few meters. Um, because if you go deeper, then the pressure presses against the housing, so it seals it up even better. So if you exactly. would have over pressure, then you would counteract this. So if you have under pressure, you really know that it's, it's tight and well sealed. Then you have smaller things like um, here you can mount ball heads on it um, you can have a rope for carrying or putting on your gear so that you don't lose your camera if you let it go because uh, what may happen is that you would need both hands to handle a situation with your gear or uh, with your dive body or so so all the time you need to be able to let your gear go and it shouldn't go off into the abyss if possible, right? Um, this one is also something funny. Um, it's like a trigger for the camera, so an additional trigger. It's easier to, um, you press with your finger here and it's like a pistol trigger. And it's easier to, to shoot with your camera with gloves and gives you a better, better feeling. Wow. And something that is really important is O-rings. Oh, this is yeah. an O-ring for your housing. Um, we have quite a few O-rings uh, for the housing, for the strobes. What are also O-rings are those blue ones, but they are not here for sealing the housing or whatever. They are just for friction. Um, so if you put the arms together. Something else that you also can get, um, it starts to be more and more common because people are richer and richer and can afford more <laughs> gadgets nowadays than they took in the past is external housing, uh, external screens. So you can use your Atmos Ninja or something like this in the separate wow. housing. The housing is connected via HDMI cable with your camera housing and this one. Um, yeah. Also here, you have to carry around, around a lot of stuff. It would be handy in, for me for macro photography or filming. But again, it's just, for me, it's a little bit of overkill. Times have changed since I did underwater photography. 
<laughs> uh, so they, they changed already in the last few years they changed a lot so like yeah. 10 years ago you wouldn't see anybody having this nowadays you see already people having this on the water and regular people not talking about the big voice <laughs> good so this was basically about all the gear that we have something very important um, is uh, maintenance and care of your gear uh, because you need to take at all with all gear you need to take care of it very well um, so something that is very important is take your time um, and do it really concentrated with care because um, a lot of times when we didn't take our time um, it gets expensive so i it happened to me to the on the galapagos i i had my housing open um i fell asleep suddenly i hear the bell that we go diving i run ran into to the the room where the cameras are i closed the camera i jumped into the water i didn't check the o-ring properly there was a hair between it um yeah I was lucky that I had a second camera with me because otherwise, uh, yeah, the camera was um, broken because it was filled up with water. Wow. Um, then, especially when you dive in salt water, you always need to clean up the camera, uh, the housing while it's closed, not the camera, the housing with fresh water um, because um, salt crystals, they, they are really bad for the O-rings and they break the O-rings and then water gets in. Here we're back to the O-rings. They're most important. So you have to use also special lubricants to, to keep them smooth and and uh, moist so that they are better because if you don't, they get the dry out they and they break. It's also important to protect. I was just going to say, import, uh, I think what most people would be shocked to know is, is your comment uh, uh, 30 seconds ago that you could just have a human hair going across the O-ring and, and it can cause your housing to leak. It does not take, you're not looking for things that are easily seen. Uh, uh, it does not take much for housing to leak. <laughs> oh, yeah, it doesn't. Even salt crystals make all, may already uh, break the O-ring. So that's why I'm really happy that I have this under pressure uh, feature of my housing because it, wow. gi it gives me a better feeling because in the in the past before I had this, normally what you did is the first time you went diving, you took the housing without a camera in it to see if the during the during the transport something went wrong or not. So this is basically uh, yeah. Then important is, of course, to protect the housing or the whole gear from shocks and scratches. Um, shocks also for uh, very important for the strobes. Um, they don't like to be, get hit. I broke two strobes uh, while transporting in the um, in the regular luggage and the airport because you know how they treat the, the gear or the the, the luggage. Um, since then my strobes come into my carry-on luggage uh, it gets heavy but um yeah i always have a very good argument on the airport etc yeah but it's heavy you have to put it in your in your regular <laughs> luggage that yeah if you're ready to pay me the money and if i arrive there and the strobe is broken and you replace it immediately it's fine for me uh, i cannot wait one day to be re to, re to have it replaced or more I want to have it replaced immediately and then they say okay then it's fine so this works quite well. <laughs> um also very important protect it from sun dust and dirt um protect it from sun it's really important that uh, before you go into the water that the housing is not hot because especially with the black housing if you're somewhere on the maldives or in egypt um, the housing gets very hot and um, that's not healthy for the housing and it's also not good if you take the hot expanded housing into the water one never knows what may happen 
importance also if you handle your camera or your your gear um, do it in a dust free and dry place a lot of dive bases they have special rooms for people to take their uh, photo gear apart re replacing batteries taking out um, taking out the uh, memory cards and so on and talking of batteries and memory cards so before you go diving always make sure that your camera is the battery is full uh, especially with the with the point and shoot you really need to replace them from dive to dive and that the camera that the memory card has still some space on it and is not locked because locked memory cards in a housing bad <laughs> <laughs> it happened to me while going diving with sharks i didn't do what i should have done and yeah it was okay i didn't have to sort out any pictures um <clears throat> then of course close the housing carefully and check for leaks if possible um, also check the o-rings and what i always do is um, i do always a full function check before diving or before leaving for the trip if i close the housing um, and also here we're back to the to the topic of the locked memory card or um, cables that are not well connected because you want to have that sorted out before you go on the water because some of the stuff like the locked memory card you cannot lock it underwater anymore what i also do is um, i have a checklist <clears throat> for my gear and my function um, checks so on one side i have the checklist before i go on vacation so that i do not forget anything because it would be annoying if you forget your floating arms or your your um your optical cables or something like this um, but also when i'm on vacations and i go on the boat for a day trip or so i need to do um, have a checklist gets long so uh, post-processing uh, i always shoot in raw uh, it makes white balance easier than doing white balance manually on the water um, especially with strobes it's um, I used to do white balance on the water. It's a pain in the butt, and if you move like five meters up, five meters down, you have to do it again because nothing is right. So that's why I shoot raw. And editing, I use the regular tools everybody else uses. So talking about um, the raw editor, like Photoshop, Lightroom, and so on. Um, most useful features, of course, the white balance. Um, that's what I use, the spot removal tool, because on the water you have a lot of um, stuff in the water that is reflected by the light and it makes spots. We will see it in the pictures. And a very nice feature that um, Photoshop um, RAW editor has is the dehaze feature. This is for on the water. This gives this nice contrast. I use it quite a lot. It uh, really made my life simpler since the dehaze feature came out. Good, talking about gear. Um, <laughs> this is what I used to shoot. Um, so what you see, uh, I had multiple cameras. Um, I have two housings. Um, they're not all the same. So two of them are Canon S120s. Um, two of them are Canon S90. You need a new housing with a new camera. Even though the camera looks almost the same, but no, they change one or two buttons, then you buy a new housing. Um, what is also special is this part down here. And this is the rig where I put my camera on. You will see it later on. Um, this is custom built by myself um, with a, some stuff just because I couldn't find anything out of the box that was existing. Wow. Um, exactly i have my floating arms down here uh, i have my two strobes i have a macro lens a macro fisheye uh, fisheye lens gopro with housing and filters and the light um, when you put it together it looks a little bit like this um, you see down here uh, those cables i used to put them on my gear 
to transport it so that if something would be i could let go and the gear i use right now is this one um so again here you see the rig already with the housing um, this part up here is also custom built by myself to be able to add um, a gopro and the light i have the vacuum pump i have the light cables i have different float arms depending on what and where i'm shooting so if i plan to shoot macro i take the short ones if i go outside shoot wide angle i to take the big ones wow. yeah and so this is basically when i go on vacation this is my photo gear what i take with me wow. uh, well, meanwhile I, here. besides <laughs> of the scuba gear absolutely <laughs> And Absolutely. sure that you don't take the tanks, the, the, correct? Yes, the tanks Every, and the weight, the tanks. I do not take yeah. the weight as well. Even it's though sad. I have a friend who once took like five kilograms of weights with him by mistake, he didn't notice. But this is not the idea. Normally when we go on vacations, the tanks and the weight is provided by the, by the operator of the dive base. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. But we, we could other rent, right? Um, but if you're diving a lot, you like to have your your own gear, uh, scuba gear, because you trust it more and you know, especially underwater photographers, it's good to know where your buttons and everything is. Exactly. And what you get. Exactly. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, the gear I'm diving with right now looks something like this. You see the, the fish, the wide angle lens is already mounted here on the housing. I can take it off. So if you go here, here, it's up here. And then this is basically what I have. Don't ask me how much it would cost. I don't want to. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so, we, we don't talk about that. We're not going to do old saying if you have to ask, you can't afford it. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's like Wayne's world. Live it now, man. You'll never afford it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. The, yes. uh, Paul, yeah. you, you mentioned that uh, this is for masochists. Now, now we understand that uh, <laughs> that that's the case. Yeah. Yeah, it's because it's quite a lot of gear, right? And it's um, it's that you have to carry it around. You have to be careful that you don't break it and so on. So it's. It gives also a certain pressure on the person while my friend also when we go on vacation while my friend just prepare their dive gear and they jump into the water and have a relaxing dive i have to prepare my dive gear and my camera and after the dive my get my friends have a beer and i'm doing the whole maintenance of the the camera and clean up and everything so this is basically so you so 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 let's say you 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 have your you prepare the night before to go to your diving site with your uh, you know the, the the organizer of the trip. Did you bring everything already assembled like this? Yes. So so basically, I do the assembly always in uh, in, in my hotel room or at home. Uh, exactly. to put everything together because a i know that i didn't forget anything um i can put it together slowly and carefully in a dry area and it's also easier to carry like this and when you're already like on the boat or so and you would suddenly have to do and put everything together you get only into stress if you have stress you make mistakes and exactly. You're not and, relaxed. And, and, you do not enjoy the dive, and you take it. And so that means that you also don't see your photos until you get back to your hotel. Correct? Uh, no, I. I mean, I can check the photos on the screen, right? Okay. But I, what I don't do, I do. I don't bring the laptop on the boat or something like this. Exactly. So I can 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 verify. This is basically the nice thing about digital photog photography on the water. I can take a picture and can immediately verify on the water if, if the, everything is right. 
uh, with film you could do that. So they don't have like a film, Wi-Fi to transmit to your to phone or iPad. Uh, uh, there would be. Uh, meanwhile, um, in the aluminium housing, it's not that easy. Uh, you of could course. do that, but to be honest, I, especially if I go on a boat trip, I wouldn't bring my mobile phone or a tablet, and so, and it's also just adding additional stress to to one. You know that you have to 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 do something, and you get nervous because the other people they have, for example, lunch, and you cannot. It doesn't change anything. So the, the only thing what I may do and I normally do is I replace the battery. Okay. So I have to open the housing anyway. Um, with the vacuum pump, it's a good thing um, or the okay. under pressure pump. But um, the risk what I have is because it's warm and humid outside that I introduce humidity into the housing and then the it gets foggy inside. So this uh, may typically, uh, um, typically, you do one dive in the morning, correct, or something. So, so a battery should last an entire dive, correct? Yeah. So the battery easy lasts a dive. It could last even two dives, depending on how many pictures you take. Exactly. Um, th the problem here is a little bit like with on one side, like with the mirrorless cameras. With those, you have the camera up and running a lot of the time. So I try to turn it off between the shots, but then you can miss some shots, right? And the other thing is uh, I shoot quite a lot with strobe. So it's mm -hmm. the strobe of the camera that is also triggered each time. And this results, of course, in a higher battery consumption than you have with, without the strobe, yeah. Wow. And the batteries are really not big, right? So. So those those batteries are, are the point and shoot batteries are pretty small, so they don't last that long. So you were saying because of the weight of your gear that it's slightly negative negative in its buoyancy when you're in the water. Yes, mine is. Yeah. Um, the point and shoot are the reason why it's negative is basically my my uh, wide angle lens because it's heavy really yeah. heavy without it no. it's, it's more or less neutral with the lens is it's heavy what you have with the with the big cameras um dslrs and so there because the housing is big and it has more air they float most of the time so some of the divers even have to add weight to it to make it a little bit more buoyant, buoyant in the negative way so they don't have to put it up, push it up, but push it down. Yeah. So, so Paul, I mean, you you mentioned that um, that uh, you use a point and shoot rather than SLR. Now, what? How many megapixels is that Canon that you put in t inside the housing? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> twenty. <laughs> okay. you, you know how important the megapixels are, right? Yes, exactly. Oh, and that is a, this is a good question. Maybe it's 12. Okay. okay. I, I don't even know. That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> now you caught me off guard. I know a lot of, about my gear. I don't know how much, how many megapixels it has. <laughs> that tells you how important the camera is in the, in the whole thing here. Yeah, it, it is. So, yeah, so basically, I will also come a little bit to that, why I changed from, from the... Uh, from the Canon to the Sony ones um, later on when I show the picture to give you an idea what my, the reason for my decision was. Um, basically, it's low light cap capability in dark area like case. Um, that's why I changed. Of course, a big camera would be better, but as, 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 you, as you have seen, it's a question of weight and price and handling the whole gear. So it's a totally different way of doing underwater photography than I do. And not only a different way because I have better gear and it's faster, but also because I'm even more antisocial with a big gear than with a medium sized gear. Yes. So that's so 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 uh, the, so they, I know that you using wide angle so focusing is a little bit easier to a degree, correct? But I presume yeah. do you still have a knob in that lens that I saw that you can focus, but 
how do you compose? Do you do you, because you, you don't put your cam do you put your camera to your face or do you look at the at the window? Yeah, so so basically compo composition happens in with this camera with the screen, right? Okay. Sometimes if you if you shoot from below to up you do not see the screen. So with wide angle it's it's easier, it's good luck, a little bit on the of experience. Of course, macro is not that easy. Um, <clears throat> I have to say with this camera, I have a little problem with my macro lens as I'm wearing, uh, wearing glasses and underwater I, uh, I wear contact lenses. And when I'm shooting macro, sometimes I do not see the small stuff on the screen. So it's a little bit of good luck. <laughs> for the big DSLRs, there is even adapters for um, the viewfinder. So there is really uh, a really complex or complicated. It's an adapter that you put on the housing with a 90 degrees or 45 degrees angle with a mirror in it and so on. So those guys are shooting sometimes uh, with the viewfinder instead of the screen. Wow. This is, yeah. Good. Um, ready for some photos, or do you guys want to go to the toilet? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I, I come back so, in a second. I do have to take my dog out here for a second. Sure. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so we start with the pictures. Um, I will show you a few pictures uh, that, that they did in the, in, the, in the past, more or less in the past. Um, and give you an idea how it started, uh, what to look at, what possibilities you have. Uh, so if you have questions or so, just put them in. So uh, let's start with the beginning. Um, this is how it started up in the year, year 2000. Um, I took this picture of a shark. Uh, you see quality is um, rather not so good. Um, the reason is a simple one. This was the camera. Um, it's a Kodak Sport. It was this one-way camera. So you had this, this film inside that uh, that you had this 24 or 36 images. Um, it was working till 10 meters of depth, but not the problem was not that it broke when you got deeper, but you couldn't. At 10 meters latest, the, the the release button was pushed, so it took a picture, and you couldn't take a picture below of 10 meters. That's why I'm so far away from the shark. So this is how it started in the past, um, and it got a little better with digital cameras nowadays. Um, let's start a little bit. Maybe you have seen this picture already in a photo review. Um, this is while ice diving, so it's the picture is, uh, you see quite well with the lights. Um, with the strokes, it's um, basically a creative picture. It's not a regular picture like we know them. Um, that's why I put it here. Um, I always added a little bit of information down here on the left side. If I think it's relevant, I will notice, uh, tell you what it is. Uh, very often it's not mm -hmm. so relevant. This is also this is an Austrian lake. Uh, it's a very clear lake. You cannot see it right now at the entry because it's um, not uh, a little bit silky here. But uh, this is one of the clearest waters I have seen. Not even in the in the sea, uh, in the salt sea, you can have such visibilities. Um, what you see here is uh, two of my friends. Uh, both of them are very skilled divers and very skilled photographers. So this one, um, you see how important buoyancy is uh, also for this one. So they are not touching the ground with their fins and they are floating in a perfect position here. Um, he is getting down. You do not see it well. Uh, you will see it later on. He is one of the guys with the big gear. And what you see, um, they have dry suits. They have big um big gloss so this is more like a making of picture that's the same two guys so here you see really the camera uh, what the guy has 
Um, this is a little bit an atypical picture because mostly the picture what people do is they take the picture of the crop like he did. He is a little bit more creative. He put a, a second diver in it with a light to have the better effect of it. Um, I took a little bit of a different approach. I took a making of picture and I think it's really interesting to see how pictures are made and it's because the other pictures hundreds of people have this picture is probably something not many people did. On the other hand, uh, how does it look what he did? Um, I took the same picture later on as well. So this is basically the other picture. Um, it's dark because of the sun. So I have to be careful that I do not blow out the sun. And what is also nice, the diver has a lamp uh, shining into it. What you see here is a little artifacts. Uh, I could put them out with Photoshop, but I didn't um, just so that I can show it. So this happened with the fisheye or wide angle lens. That's just um, normal. We have the same, we could have the same effect with wide angle, wide angle lenses above water. Another problem that we have, of course, also with JPEG is uh, if you see the sun, how it's blown out and you have this really nasty or nasty, not so very nice um, changes from white into this weirdish green. Um, this happens a lot underwater, unfortunately. This is another picture. Um, here you see the diver from below. Um, well lit. So this is with the strobes because if I wouldn't have used the strobes, you would see him just all black. Even the eyes are well lit. Uh, you can see the bridge above water um, because the water is quite clear, but not very clear. So you have also a lot of um, particles in the water uh, swimming around. So normally, if you have a lot of time, you can put them out with the brush healing tool, but it takes like forever. Same location, different approach. Um, this is a half-half picture. It's easier to do it with a DSLR with a big dome in front of it. Um, you see the bridge is not sharp, the divers are. The reason is, of course, of the, of the density of the water and the focal thing. The, I, I put this picture in here a little bit to show um, one, the technique of half-half pictures. And the other thing what I did is to show you um, that on one side beneath the water, it's way darker than, than above. And the other thing is that you see that the divers are sharp and up here not. The reason is I have a very small uh, aperture. So it could be corrected in a certain amount by um, using F10, F12, uh, F11 or something like this. Um, I didn't think about it when I took these pictures. Nowadays, I do the picture differently than I used to do it there. So I would change my aperture nowadays. I did it here. So you see, two years later, I learned out of my mistakes. Um, <laughs> you see the diver is more or less clean. The, also the, the boat is clean. Um, unfortunately, the water was not very um, clean because it was in a little bit of a harbor. It's not very deep. There is a lot of dirt underwater. That's why you have all the white spots. That's, a little bit of a pity, but it's it's lies in the nature of the dive place. Um, what you also see a little bit here is um, the, in this area there is water. What is very hard with the half half pictures is is that you do not have any spots, water spots on your um, wide yeah. angle, because otherwise it. it just gives a very strange effect. So most of the pictures I take like this, I throw away because it has uh, water spots on the housing, unfortunately. Then this one also, I've already sent in for picture review once. Yeah. Um, this is a... Weaning. 
this is more like something that the one would not see in magazines, right? Uh, it's a portrait uh, of a, this um, sweet lip with the cleaner fish in its mouth. Um, here, what is important is know your surroundings. So know the animals, uh, be patient. It takes quite a lot of time to do this. This picture is the lot she shot with, the, with a point and shoot because when you press it has to focus and then shoot it may take a few milliseconds or a second with a dslr of course it would be easier to take this shot so with a point and shoot it's more good luck than with a big camera um same here a little shark um also here getting close um was important without carrying the shark away so it's like with all animals you have to get a feeling if the animal gets nervous if they don't feel okay and what i did here is um i what i normally do not do is i zoomed in with the underwater camera to get closer but it's fine because um, it's still a sort of a macro shot i was rather close and I didn't have too much water between me and the, and the shark. So then the zooming works quite well. And you see here, I didn't use any lens. So it's not a macro lens and it's not a wide angle to take that shot. Mm -hmm. Similar thing here. Um, this eagle ray was swimming in, in outside in the water in the current. I was next to it. Here it was. I was lucky that he, he was really patient with me. Um, normally they are not, but this one was. And uh, also the lightning was quite good. So it takes a lot of luck to take this. And um, it's for me, it's a lucky shot that the, the situation was good as well. Oh, Same nice. here with turtles. Turtles are a little easier. Um, what you see here, the background is, is black. Um, this comes with the very short exposure time and uh, um, the F7.1 and the strobes. So basically, this was during daytime. So the, normally the, the water would be blue. And um, I took it like this because the turtle was really close. And they, they are very curious. So that's, that helps. Uh, my favorite uh, creature. <laughs> yes, manta rays. Uh, manta rays. Oh my goodness, I love them. This one, of course, you have to take with the wide angle because if you don't, then there is too much water between you and the the subject. Um, it's well lit. The problem here is a little bit. It's a little too well lit. So you see um, the sun here. The highlights are blown out. It gives this weird bluish shine um, that then when you edit it and save it in JPEG, it's even worse. Um, so this is basically, pr the problem is you set up your camera, you shoot it and it's so, the animals sometimes are so fastly gone that you have no time to adjust your, your uh, aperture or your, um, uh, your ISO um, to to be correct. Um, with, with the new camera, I'm not even shooting auto ISO anymore because uh, the strobes are not behaving very well with the camera. So um, nowadays I have to shoot um, full of uh, full manual. The problem is a little bit I have just two wheels to do my configuration, so I. I have one for for aperture. I have one for um, yeah, timing, and if I want to change ISO, it's a little bit more uh, complicated than on the DSLR, and it takes a little bit more time. So that, um, yeah, this is this is another picture. Um, this is a bull shark in Mexico. Um, yeah in front of Playa Carmen. So people, if they would know what is lurking yeah. beneath the water, they wouldn't go into the water, but there is never anything happening. Um, why I 
show you these pictures as you see it's very blue um the reason for that is if you do this dive they do not allow you to bring light underwater because light especially strobes may trigger the sharks to get nervous and steal your camera or bite your camera or something like oh. this so we had to go into a depth of 20 meters sit in the sand and then shoot the yeah then shoot them just with a camera without lights this is how it comes up you see it's totally blue wow. and no matter what you do you cannot Can't make you. it better right yeah so you see it's it's really um yeah it's really hard to shoot i could have i wasn't prepared for that i could have made uh, white balance on the water i don't know if it would have helped but i'm not very used to the white balance on the water because i never suddenly do it and if you do a dive shark with a uh, dive with sharks where you have to concentrate on those animals as well and on the depth um, i didn't want to fiddle around with white balance that's why i left it on so the other side of the divers you know that 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 create the stir that the there's a 30 foot shark down there because everything looks bigger than it really is. You know, uh, yes, it is. <laughs> you come up, you go, do you see that 30 foot shark? And you know, they're only not 30 feet, but, <laughs> yeah, but, but what did they have? I don't know. They're let's say nine feet long that are bull shark females that somewhere around there, they, they are, they're pregnant and they are, um, giving birth to their uh, to their offspring somewhere around there and till the offspring comes out they are swimming in front of the beaches or, and are just there but you never know because i don't know how uh, it's pregnant women are strange i don't <laughs> want to know how how strange pregnant bull sharks are right <laughs> you never know on the other side we have this picture um Similar animal, right? Um, similar depth, different. Uh, here I was able to use strobes, and so of course we have all the the dirt here that is lighted up. But you have already much more color in it and better contrast, and it, it looks already way better with the with the strobes than without. So you see what the difference is. Yeah, and for the majority of us that have never taken an underwater photograph, um, you guys have nothing to complain about. Uh, you got so many other factors underwater that you have absolutely no control over. Uh, you think you you think you have it bad on the surface. You want to really torture yourself? Uh, do what Paul's doing right now if you really want to get yourself frustrated real quick because. It's it's multitudes of times more difficult than taking pictures uh, above the water. <laughs> yeah, and the learning curve is um, quite big, right? You, you need to be very, as I said again at the beginning, you need to be very patient and uh, also be prone to a certain level of frustration because there is so, like with dolphins, they come sometimes, they are here for a minute or two, and if you don't, set up everything then you miss it i already missed the manta rays because i was head first in the reef taking macro shots and the manta passed behind me so <laughs> good um then another thing that i take is macro photograph macro photography and those are mandarin fish what is special on those is they live in the corals well hidden and they come out at dawn in the evening to mate every evening and they don't like light so in certain areas of the world they do but here they didn't so you have to go there you have your lamp set to red light because they do not see the red light and then you need to guess on your camera where the fish is and if the camera focuses or not um, what is also not very nice is the background here uh, but it's really challenging to take the pictures with a good background with all those conditions that you have and they are really quick they come out they swim they mate 
Um, they are pretty small. They are like one to two inches long. So this is um, macro shot. Other macro shot is this one. Um, <laughs> see, the, see the Smurf for scale, right? I heard, I heard um, they lived underwater, but now, yeah. now you, know, you have photographic evidence. <laughs> this, this is my so-called macro Smurf. Um, so if we do workshops with people underwater, photography with macro, I take the Smurf so they can take pictures in the pool of something at least. Um, so this is quite a good thing. What you see here in the front, um, is a so-called blurring octopus. You see how big it is. I mean, it's less than an inch in, in size. Um, if you think the bull shark is a dangerous animal, you didn't meet this one. Um, they do not attack people, but if this one would bite you, yeah, enjoy the rest of your diet. Uh, you will <laughs> for sure not make it in the hospital and they could couldn't help you anyway because those animals are that poisonous uh, so the poison they have is the most venomous in the world it seems um, so um, yeah it's but they are really and hard to find and when they get dressed they have those blue rings that's why they are called blue ring octopus um, sometimes the guides that start to tease them with a stick or so that they even get more of those those rings, um, this one is not very shiny, but you see how small he is. <laughs> Other thing is this one, uh, this is a frogfish. Oh, yeah. It was pure luck that the guy found, uh, the guy found it. Um, it looked like a big one, but it's not um, for scale, how small it is. So this is my finger and the wow. frogfish. So first of all, you have to find it, and the, then on the other hand, you I also explained the composition that is not very good because you don't have a lot of space to put your camera there to make good composition, right? So you do not have too much of a of a choice. Um, something else to say: this is uh, this picture I took with my Nikon Coolpix. 5,600. It's, I mean, it's a really old camera. It was my first digital camera that I had. And if I look at the pictures now, they, they are quite decent. They are not that bad for the, for the camera I had. Um, so also here, of course, camera helps, but camera is not everything. You can also with a old bad camera, you can do, um, decent pictures. So. Then we have here a wide angle shot. Um, I like it quite a lot, but something what you see here is, um, I mean, the contrast is really nice with the with the white in the front and the orange uh, anemone fish or nemos. What you have a lot is um, here dirt, but you also see, I didn't take it out, is here on the borders, it's basically, um, from the wide angle lens and uh, normally i have to zoom in a little bit that i don't have this effect or i have to crop it the proper way to get it out something that you also see again um this is a disadvantage of the of those uh, point and shoot and jpeg you see the effect here around the the sun is really not so nice and i just didn't couldn't find out how to properly edit it without getting that. Maybe a bigger color depth of the cameras would help and uh, not saving it as JPEG at the end. But yeah. This is also something um, about composition and color. Um, I really like the Nemo, the orange Nemo in front of the green anemone. It's popping up uh, very much. So this is, uh, it helps because sometimes you have animals that are not, um, especially in Egypt, uh, if you go diving, the guides, they love to show you stonefish or scorpion fish. And I don't know if any of one of you know how a scorpion or a stonefish look like, 
as the name says, stonefish, they look like stones. So they always tell me, yeah, look, look, a stonefish, take a yeah, picture. Don't ever step on but, it. Yeah, you do not step on them, that's a good thing, but taking a picture of a stonefish is just so, so boring. It's really, you cannot take a good picture of them, a picture of them. So they always try to show me and I never really care. So it's, <laughs> expectations of them and mine are different <laughs> this is a wide angle shot with a light um, it's not very deep five meters deep that's why you see also quite a lot of colors besides of the one um wow uh, the one i have i like this picture what is really boring is this blue part up, up here and the reason is because in egypt you seldomly have clouds. You always, very often have blue or gray sky, mostly blue. But what would be really nice if you would have some some clouds in the sky, then this whole area here wouldn't look that empty. <clears throat> See, so, but this is you cannot influence that as a diver. You cannot order clouds, right? Wow. But it would have made a big difference if we would have more clouds. The rest is, of course, the reflection of the. In the water surface of the of the reef because it's not very deep um, same over here and one of the bi biggest pain points is to get the fish to look into the camera because <laughs> I, I always said i could do two very big picture books one is sunset of this world very boring always the same but one has always to take the sunset and the water the other one is fish butts because normally yeah. the fish turn yeah. always their butts to, to me and to get the fish looking in the right direction is not very easy uh, it's, it's very much uh, similar to birding and the, and the, exactly. the, the birds yeah. don't listen to you when you say can you turn your hat, head another 15 degrees you know or whatever uh, any more than the fish are going to listen to you <laughs> yeah. At least the fish sometimes stick around a cold head like that one. Yeah. Well, yes. So. Yeah, but they like to hide. So exactly. especially, especially the yellow ones, they, the those, they, they always try to to hide somewhere. So you have to be really patient and lucky to to get them like this. Good. This this one is a wide angle shot. Um, you see the yeah. corals are beautiful underwater and they're really nice. You need a lot of light because we're talking here about a depth of 20 to 25 meters. So without without the strobe, it would look like the behind here. Uh, what makes it nice uh, is to add something else to the shot, like the scuba diver. Um, unfortunately, what would have been nice is if the guy would have a lamp in his hand. It gives an additional effect. But already this makes the picture way better if you would compare it without uh, the scuba diver. Um, talking about lamps, you oh, see yeah. here, this is an Oman. Here, very strange Oman, even though it's salt water, the water is green. There is so much plankton uh, that it's green. So you see the moray eel here and the diver with the lamp um, that is shining. It, it gives a little bit more of a, um, I think it's nicer to have the, the scuba diver with the lamp than if there wouldn't be the scuba diver at all or even without the lamp. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is how scuba divers with cameras look underwater. So she used to have, I think she had, a, it's a while ago, right? It's 10 years ago. I think she had an Olympus in the housing, but it was a mirrorless or something like this. Um, so she had a big housing with the big dome port. Um, what what you see here is she's well lit, but the leg looks weird. She looks like a pirate <laughs> because the fin is here on the side. So also I did I noticed that above water and not before. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of the leg looks really strange. <laughs> <laughs> but what uh, you see here, human octopus. When you get your camera down there, you look like an octopus. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. What, what you see here, she has a strobe uh, with electrical cables connected to her housing, not optical like I do. And you see, she doesn't have any float arms because the housing itself generates already so much lift that she doesn't need to have float arms anymore. So this is because especially the dome port, there is a difference between the dome port for wide angle and the, this fish eye or this wide angle um, wetland that we have. This one is generating uplift and mine is generating um, downlift. Yeah. Then we have other things. Sometimes we send the people to get some beer. Um, <laughs> this was in Curacao. Um, yeah, people throw everything into the sea. Uh, even the box is empty, but yeah, we we from time to time we do for, do a reef cleanup, and I really like this one. It's like her getting getting beer underwater. Uh, so that, I know that beer. That's a Venezuelan know, beer. You gotta, you gotta yeah. get yeah. The, you gotta get the sharks drunk so you feel safer. <laughs> yeah, this Venezuelan beer and um, Curacao they have. Most of the time they use this one, yeah. Yes. Um, this is also what I like about this picture. I could have taken it a little darker. Um, but uh, what I like is on one side the, the sun beams coming down and on the other side the, the colors, right? Because normally the problem with scuba divers is the gear is always black and um, it's not very photogenic. The gear uh, is... Is this that one a, has that a nuda branch? Is that what they call that? Yes, exactly. That's a nuda branch that he has in his hand. Um, I have no clue what what is called in English this one, but it's quite a big one. Um, and okay. that it was like uh, it was a sort of a case where we are inside, and there were, there was a lot of those uh, nuda branches in there. And you see what is really nice: the pink colors and the nuda branch itself had also a lot a little bit of a pink uh, border here so it matches quite well what is also good is um, the whole facial area is well lit because mostly you have um, the half eye that is dark that is not well lit this makes the pink goggles make it really stand out so that's why i like if you have people that are a little bit more colorful and have a little bit um different gear than than the regular one because if, if you would have a, a scuba diver with regular gear with black gloves black mask black um hose then it would be way more boring than this yeah then from time to time the, <laughs> have to go to the toilet as well <laughs> so that's basically how that looks um then another thing that we take pictures of is uh, wrecks. Wrecks are not very easy um, because you see it's blue in blue. We are like we're back on the on the um, shark pictures of before. Um, you have to take the picture in wide angle anyway to get as close as possible to the wreck. Um, but even if you if you use your strobes, it will not help at all. Because, wow. Uh, yeah. You, so, yeah you would need... You're pretty deep at that point, too, usually. Yeah, exactly. So the, this boat, the bottom here is like 30, 35 meters. Up here, we are talking about 25 meters. So it's, you're quite deep here already. So another picture of a of a wreck. This one is in Malta. Uh, this one isn't that deep but still talking 50 meters uh, this picture is how it came out of the camera <clears throat> um, so this is how it looks then i tried to do some white balance um, no not very um, not very nice the problem is it makes the white balance here but up here because um, it's way less deep it's changes the color into this violet one. So when you remember the, the picture of the, how deep the colors go, here you see it. So this picture or editing is kind of useless. 
So what I did, I went black and white um, because this looks a little bit the best, but it's still not very easy to do a good picture, especially with the visibility. Um, other wreck picture is this one. Um, this is inside the Sithelgom. This is uh, one of the most famous wrecks in the world and in the Red Sea. It's an English ship that sunk during World War II. Um, and this is in one of the rooms. What is interesting is um, due to the divers that dive inside, you have air collecting here at the surface or at the no, it's not the roof, it's the, how it's called, top of the room. Um, and you see the diver reflecting in it as well. Uh, I didn't shoot that one with a strobe because um, there is a lot of dirt inside due to the diver. So there is a lot of particles in the water and you, it would look like you shoot into, uh, into snow. So that's why I couldn't do that. So, so, Paul, let me ask you a question, because with sure. that uh, uh, wreck that you were showing there, obviously that's mostly ambient light, and you mentioned about the, your strobe. It, obviously, you know, with a strobe, it works on the function of the inverse of the squares of the distance, correct, that you lose. Mm -hmm. But on the water, being denser, did you, what, how much light did you lose with distance? Also yeah, work... Well quite a lot yes okay. um, so, so also with the strobe you you could see it quite well in the wide angle shots that i i did so with my strobes how if you put them on full power let's say you can shoot like four or five meters with color and then the color is already gone yeah. and i should know but but it's not the inverse of the it's not the is not the inverse of the uh, square of the law distance, correct? Right? Yeah, in, in sort it is, right? Because you know that the light is not like a laser going in one direction, but exactly. it's like going going into the into all directions. So the further away you are, um, the less light gets gets there because it's diffused. Exactly. And the same thing is it has to get back again to you, right? It has to be reflected from the object back to you. So, and because the water is really, really dense. Exactly. You do, do not get very far. Um, there is people who use remote lighting as well. So if they're light shipwrecks or so, okay. that they put strobes somewhere away, detached. I mean, this is really, these are big productions, right? You need to have the people who help you with that and our patients and mostly other divers are not very patient to, to do that. So that's why, yeah. yeah, lighting is not very easy, but I have seen pictures of, of big wrecks lighted up, but they are, they use quite a lot of lights and detached lights and so on. And I don't, they probably took just this one picture because it took them, a long time to set up everything yeah. like you said the problem is still using the flash especially like if you like you said if you're going to use full power and you've got a lot of and you're and you're not in clear water and the and the ocean is you know it's not like people confuse what they think is dirty water like like diving in new england like exactly. you said, sometimes you're lucky if you have two foot visibility and it isn't because the water's dirty it's just because you have, you either have a you have a lot of microscope microscopic organisms or plant life, or your or uh, your the bottom's getting stirred up too much, you know, and uh, you got all that particulates in the water, so uh, that messes with your your uh, flash coverage as well. Or like you said, you get the reflections of er anything that's floating in the water gets reflected. And then you then you have way too many uh, you 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 complain people complain we complain about a few dust spots on our sensor showing up in a in an image where we have the sky and we complain about it but you know when you're taking a flash underwater you're gonna have thousands of you could have thousands of little specks in your picture that show up <laughs> exactly yeah so 
this is another picture. This one is also in the brack with a strobe um, because I was close. Uh, what what I really like is the fish looking into this ball, <laughs> and and the ball is silver because all the diver come and touch it. So it's <laughs> like sometimes you have statues somewhere that uh, are brownish or so from from oxidation, and the nose of the statue is golden because everybody touches the nose or 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 the head or something. It's the same effect. So it looks like looking into the crystal ball. Um, Basic. This is also special. Um, this was shot in uh, Mexico in the cenotes. Um, okay. Cenotes are challenging because on one side it's dark, on the other side it's uh, light is coming in. What I really like is um, the light beam here. The sun is or the the bright part of, are not overly overshot, uh, and the guy is still. Um, well lit, also stuff here. But I had other shots in the cenote where I was so frustrated with my Canon at 120 because uh, the light sensitivity of the small camera was not very good. That I decided to get a new camera after a few years, so that's why I switched over to the Sony RX100. Um, so basically, one this this dive made me change my mind for the cenotes because the other pictures in the cenotes where it was darker were not that nice. So 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 did you experience one of those when the change on density of water that you have these micro climbs I remember diving in uh, uh, close to rivers that you go from one layer mm. that had different density to the other and so suddenly everything is blurry. I, I I didn't do the dive in those uh, cenotes. I think there's a few cenotes in Mexico that have that. They have the fresh water on top, and yes. then they have the salt water at the bottom. I would like to do that one day. I haven't done it. Yeah. What I experienced already a few times, we have this a lot in Switzerland, is the thermal client. Okay. And this means you have <clears throat> warm water at the top, colder water below, and if you dive between it, you have this flimmering um, between the. It's like really a, a layer that yeah. can be seen that is really visible. Yeah. The, the 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 place that I used to dive, because it was close to a river. I mean, depending on how much yeah. water was coming out of the river, suddenly you will be diving, uh, and then you will be in a place that everything is, you know, like. Uh, not so clear. Everything it was uh, like like looking through through a, a defective glass. Yes. <laughs> Good. Then another possibility to shoot in a cave against the sun is without light. So we see this one. Uh, what makes it nice? Uh, this person has a has a torch, so it gives an additional. It's a bit of a color, but it's a totally different shot. Um, would be nicer to have it the person more in the back, so that you would have the black silhouette of the person in the uh, in the light. But uh, just how it is. Good. Coming closely to an end. Um, another way to shoot is night dive. Um, there the rules change again, so you will, you need a light. Um, you have totally different animals, so what we have here is a squid, um, a very curious one. Uh, so those, sometimes they're shy, sometimes they come to the light and see uh, what there is. So here you can really shoot in the night against the black water and um, you have it, but the thing is, you always need a light on the top because otherwise you wouldn't find the animals and you wouldn't be able to focus. But on the other side, sometimes the animals come closer um, and you have totally different animals. But in the night, regularly you shoot macro or regular angle, but not wide angle. Exactly. I've tried it once or twice, but it makes kind of no sense. Something else you have. This Good. one, little squid, comes out only at night. Um, this one is smaller than a thumb. 
so it's really really small but nicely colored and something what comes out as well it, at night are those Spanish dancers. Unfortunately, I do not have a good picture of why they are called Spanish dancers. So it's a new debris. And if they sometimes they swim up and in the water they move like a flamenco dancer. So they're red and they are dancing. It looks really nice. Um, they have a really good contrast. Something what you can also see down here. So he, the new debris has a blind passenger on it. It's uh, Emperor Shrimp that is riding along with her and <laughs> um, eats whatever falls off from the from the new Debra. And last and no, not not very last, but last topic is this one. And um, do you guess what it is? Okay, coral. Name says brain, it. Brain yeah. Coral. yeah, exactly. It's a brain coral. Brain coral. Um, I, I have a one of my lamps that I have has a UV light and if you you can shoot if you shine UV light in the night on the corals that then they shine in total different colors some of the animals as well they're uh, bioluminescent no not, not uh, fluorescent bioluminescent UV if they shine by themselves those are reflecting the UV light so this is also um, some special sort of photography if you use UV light for shooting on the water. There, the trick is a little bit, um, you do not have UV strobe, so you have just the UV light and it's not reflecting so much light. That means you have to go quite high with the ISO and um, need to have a slower shutter for that because otherwise you do not get a lot of light inside. That can be seen here. Um, you see in here the Nemo is basically black, so the clownfish. Mm. And because of the short shutter speed, the anemone tentacles are not sharp at all. And this is really because the, in the UV light you do not have those. Um, um, yeah, you do not have enough light to do so. What you can also do, sometimes you put a yellow filter on your camera, then this violet light would be filtered out and it would pop more. Um, I do not like to shoot with the yellow filter because it's it's hard to put it on my camera. And that's, it's always very, very fiddly and not very nice. So, uh, no. Let's put it that way. You made it. It took a little <laughs> longer than expected. Oh, was that's it? fine. That's fine. It was, I mean, uh, uh, for those of you that uh, uh, yeah. have been enjoying this, uh, you know, give I give call, uh, Paul a lot of credit because he he put this whole thing together in basically I think two weeks. Wow. Uh, so. Uh, to do to spend the time that he had to spend to put this together and share it with us, uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, and this could have, to me, could have been a you know a several month project, you know. And and he put it together in a couple weeks and entertained us all for um, a good part of the show here, which is great. And I uh, can't thank you enough, Paul, for doing this. Um, and of course. Uh, diving has a special place in my heart, uh, as well as Gustavo's, because uh, uh, it was uh, a love that I had when I was uh, many years ago, when I was about uh, 17 years old, uh, which was like five years ago. <clears throat> uh, but uh, <laughs> thank you so much, sir. Uh, we cannot thank you enough. A wonderful, wonderful presentation. You're welcome. Thanks for being patient, I hope not too many people fall asleep. Uh, like how many, oh, still 23 watching at least. So it's not just the five of us. Um, yeah, so happy to do that. Um, thanks for asking me to do this. Um, do you have any questions or anything else? Or oh, I, just, I just found it amazing that, I mean, maybe they had it back in the 70s or, or, or the 80s. I don't think they did. But the the fact that you have these wet lenses that you could 
change exactly the water uh i didn't know anything about that i mean uh, right. in the era that i was taking pictures you, you basically had uh I mean, what was afford somewhat affordable at the time was the acrylic, you know, Icolite housings for your SLR cameras, and and like you said, you you had to you had a housing that was a certain size based on being able to facilitate a certain lens or maybe two lenses, you know, um, and now you know. And then you get into the, you know, the higher end ones now where you have ports where you can, you know, put different lenses on or longer lenses on and just have different ports. And but this whole uh, process of, of being able to change a lens underwater uh, yeah. blew me away. I mean, I, I had no idea they had something like that. So uh, that's amazing. <laughs> I agree, I agree hundred percent. And these videos are wonderful, Paul, as well. I mean, wow, so beautiful. Thank you. There are probably most of them are sent to the GoPro. <laughs> hey, so, wow. Whatever works, man, and it works. Yeah, absolutely. You I know. Mean. So so let me ask a question here because obviously sure. you you mentioned that of course you had to die with a body, but the the your diving bodies are also photographers or they're just scuba diving yeah. with you. It, it it depends quite a lot. Um, few of them are, um, few of them are not. Um, it depends on the bodies. Um, most most of my bodies are not so. Like when we go on vacation, the last time we were in Curacao, we were there were eight of us. Uh, there was one more that is doing. A little bit of photography, but otherwise, I'm the only one who did it. On the other side, the picture you did see on uh, the first pictures that we took, took in the Austrian lake with this, uh, with the cross. Um, yeah. So I had two bodies. Both of them are photographers. One of them I would even consider for me a sort of a mentor because he taught me quite a lot. Yeah. So it's totally different, yeah. But. So do you ever like if you go on a say you went on a on a on a, a dive trip where uh, let's just say the majority of people were photographers? Do you and 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 typically uh, from my past years of diving, lots of times you you know you would do two dive at least two dives a day. Uh, you know you would do a deep dive, might be a decompression dive, and then you know later in the day you would do a shallow dive. Um, cause you could get away with it. You, you got enough of the, uh, nitrogen out of your body or whatever. So, um, so do you ever have it where you say, okay, uh, you're, you're going to take the pictures on this, on, on a certain dive and your buddy is just going to kind of like watch your back and be near you. And then the next dive, that person is taking the pictures and you're doing the same, or do you find it where, you know, because you have good, I unfortunately had the experience of <laughs> too many times not having a very good dive buddy, uh, which in one case became uh, life threatening for me on a dive. And uh, luckily I'm still here. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, uh, do you alternate or have you gotten to where, you know, you guys can almost like just know each other so well where you could both take pictures and still you know, know, know exactly where the other guy is and without having to go search for him. <laughs> yeah, so so something what I do is I really like to go, especially on vacation, with with my bodies, right? So uh, the people I do have already so many dives with uh, that are very good friends in private as well. So I really rather go diving with them in this case, it doesn't really matter if both are photographers or only me. Um, if both are both take a camera, uh, we do not alternate normally, okay. uh, but we know each other quite well. So we, as a few of my buddies, I, I always know where they are. I do not have even to, to look for them. So I just turn my head around and they're there when I, where I expect them compared to if I would go with people I don't know, they are everywhere exactly. but where I expect them. Um, so this makes it easier. 
what also changed a bit in my in the groups where I dive mostly people take a camera because they want to show off something right uh, but they are not really interested in, in taking pictures they want to sort to show off something have some memories and since I dive a lot of my friends uh, or did I take pictures a few of my friends stopped taking pictures on the water because they said okay Pavel will share anyway the the pictures with us and uh, we don't have to take care of it and go through all the hustle carrying it around <laughs> making the post editing and so on and so forth so it's for them it's way easier to um to do that because i think quite a lot of people do not like really taking picture on the water they are just they need it for Instagram or for Facebook or to share with mm -hmm. their loved ones, right? And what you, I you also are the, do very often. You are yeah. the designated photographer. Yeah, so, you're the yes, designated Yes, exactly. It's, it's, it's yeah. a little bit like this, right? So I, I, I really have a few I have a few friends who started photography on the water and they do it really seriously, like I do. But I have quite a lot of friends who, who stopped. They bought the camera for underwater, they took it. They were frustrated because they figure out if you, if you have dropped the camera on the housing, it's not the same like a guy with a with a lens and two strokes and and understanding what he's doing. So this is this is a, this is basically a big difference. And what I also do quite a lot is um, when we go diving, I like to go on so-called liveaboards. Um, this is basically a dive boat where you stay on for a whole week. So you live there, you have there your your room, your bed, you stay for the whole week on the boat. And often you have people that take their GoPro or their camera. They are not very skilled because they're a beginner. Everybody was a beginner, right? Nobody yeah. started up as, as a skilled one. And they take the cameras. They are they're really busy with diving and cannot take pictures. I say then, leave the camera outside, go diving. I take a few pictures of you. You can get them. You do not break the reef. Um, you do not stress yourself. You do not make an have an accident. And that's why I really um, try to. Yeah, I also share my pictures. I do not. I do do not sell them. I do not. I always say, uh, without my bodies that I take pictures of, I wouldn't have the picture, right? Because uh, we have seen a few pictures where you had people in it that make the difference. If they wouldn't be there, the picture would be boring. So it's basically also their pictures. Like I say, if I go with a with a guy that is showing me stuff, my pictures are also his pictures because if the guy wouldn't find anything, I wouldn't see it. I couldn't take a picture. So it's like a little bit. I, I just press the, I have the gear, I press the button. They have the eyes and they have the knowledge where to find the stuff. So well, once, once again, uh, I can't thank you enough. I, I really appreciate it. I mean, this is something that I hope you, I hope you inspired other people in the chat to. Um, like I said, uh, this is this is a photographic community. Uh, we're we're only as good as the sum of our parts, and we happen to have a uh, pretty good parts uh, in this community. And uh, so I encourage others to share their knowledge um, in in their particular genre of photography, or like I said, tips and tricks, or or gear tips, or 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 things that have made their life easier. Uh, or post-processing tips or, or what have you, uh, because we're all here to learn. And um, the one thing they probably got out of this is it's obviously very expensive to get into underwater photography. So uh, once again, yeah. if, you, if you think shooting on the surface costs a lot of money, uh, double or double or triple that when you go underwater. Um, but uh but it gives you great re rewards too. I mean, I when I was doing underwater photography, I couldn't afford a strobe. And when I went on a dive trip, uh, the dive master who I worked at a dive shop, 
uh, part time, and I was going through the assistant instructor training program um, at the time. And I worked part time at the dive shop, and we went on a trip to South Caicos uh, Island. In, in the Turks and Caicos Island chain, and uh, he had a strobe. He's one of the few that had a, you know, just a single arm, big Icolite strobe, and he was nice enough to share it with me on a few dives where I was able to use you know, used his strobe on my camera, so everything wasn't just blue, like you said, because uh, we were diving deep enough where there was no color of anything where we were diving. Everything was just black or blue, um, so thankfully he let, lent me a strobe, but it's a it's a wonderful thing to do, and if you, even if you never take pictures, uh, diving is gives you a whole different viewpoint of the planet. Um, there's just so many amazing things underwater. So and, and just start off snorkeling, you know, go on your vacation trips and and you know rent just a, a snorkel and a mask and a pair of fins and enjoy it from the surface and, you know, dive down five or six feet and come up and get your, as they say, get your, get your fins wet doing that. And then you may find yourself wanting to get into scuba diving. You, you, you will not regret it. It is, it is something I'll never forget my, my, that I, in my lifetime, uh, I saw things I can't imagine ever having seen, you know, between like you said, manta rays are my favorite manta rays and, sea turtles and moray eels and 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 everything that's down there is just amazing from big things to small things but well and, and, and jeff i mean obviously we need to take our hat to paul because yes. we know not only how good he is as an underwater photographer but we have seen his bird photography his created photography yes. which is also equally wonderful and uh, and and i second your comments about uh, I mean, this presentation, like we have here, I think you believe Arthur mentioned before, this is a master class. You will not see that anywhere. You have to have a community like this when people are prepared to bring together these type of topics on what their passion is, correct? So fantastic. I mean, I'm speechless. This is so beautiful. And it's now, and it's now a permanent record, thanks to YouTube. As long as YouTube's around, anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so thanks Thank you very again. much for the counselor. Well, I'm gonna, we're going to let you go back to sleep because I know it's what is it uh, your time? Six a.m. Uh, Six a. soon, man. <laughs> so, uh, well, I I overstepped a little bit my half hour, right? No, 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 oh, no. no. Okay. <laughs> when you're on a roll, man, you're on a roll. I let it go. Sorry Just, for that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't expect it to take that long. I well, assumed it was shorter, but it's okay. Yeah, so. it's, a once in a life, it's a once in a lifetime topic uh, for for uh, to have on this show. So thank you very much. And now nobody can complain about how difficult it is to do photography. <laughs> That's right. No one here, nobody here has any right anymore to complain about surface above surface photography anymore. Exactly. <laughs> I'll find something. Yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> but thanks again, my friend. And You're welcome. Uh, I mean, we look forward to seeing whatever images you share with us for the next photo review. We'll do. We'll do. Thank you. Okay. Very much. So, good night, or yeah, good night, gentlemen. Thanks for having me, and enjoy the rest of the the evening. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks bye -bye. again. Good stuff. That was, that was uh, a treat. Oh, that it was. That was. That was. Yeah, you know, words don't describe it well enough. What that was. It was just fantastic. Uh, you know, uh, like I said, people don't be afraid to share things. It it doesn't have to be as 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 detailed and thorough as what we just got, but uh, do not be afraid to share. You know what you do. Uh, too big here. What's going on? I can't. I can't. I you can't, got promoted. Uh, you got promoted. <laughs> You're running the show. I cannot move uh, anybody else over. Oh, brother. Oh, there oh. we go. Now I'm scaring everybody. Uh, the uh, so I didn't get to see anybody's comments in the chat. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, Same too. 
we're going to uh, just have some general discussion now, and it is 12, uh, almost 1 o'clock, so we don't have a lot of time. We are going to talk about firmware version 5 or Z9 a little bit, but uh, before, hey. before, yeah, before I, yeah, you know, before I get to that, I'm going to, I got a, actually a video to share for you in a little bit. I'm going to do, uh, do a couple uh, did you know uh, did you know segments and uh, Tim, aka Mozman, is joining us here, live live from the blue the blue room the blue lagoon. underwater. Uh, he is now <laughs> underwater at a depth of about <laughs> eighty feet, where there's no visible light uh, or very little visible light. Hello, hello. Cheers, gentlemen. <laughs> hey, Roy. At one point, you were going down under because you went upside down. So. We say, oh, yeah, we I've got this little tiny broken webcam I'm using because I didn't want to go upstairs again. <laughs> Three flights of stairs, or get the webcam out. I thought yeah. you were doing aerobics or something. Exactly. The, just the right perspective. <laughs> South of the equator. <laughs> um, a few I'm pieces. It's a good picture. Yeah, it's good. It ain't bad. We're not going to say it's better than the than the Z6 or nothing, but it's it's pretty good. <laughs> Whatever works. I'm going to do a few uh, did you knows. I hope I kept my video on here. Yeah, I was going to ask Scooby about the red filters and orange filters. And yeah, it's uh, I never did filters. Um, and like I said, it was it was it was decades ago where I did it, but it's. Uh, Definitely, you know, if, if you really have to have the strobes, I mean, you know, the, the only time you're going to get away with, if you're in 15 feet of water, and, and there are places mm -hmm. on the planet where you could dive, and there's coral that's relatively close to the surface of the water. Sometimes the coral is almost poking out of the water, like Elkhorn coral is one that grows in very shallow water, and I'm talking 20 feet deep type of thing and uh and so if you get uh fish swimming around that and you just have a one of those waterproof uh uh olympus yeah, like, on the the tough the tough uh cameras or whatever that can go underwater for action cams yeah i mean you can uh you could get some nice shots uh, as long as you could go down and hold your breath for a little bit and, and take off a, get a few shots or hit the video button uh, you'd be surprised what you could get. Uh, Big and, enough light, you can cook your own fish. You know, yeah. Yeah, or you could cook like a fish if you stay in the water too long. Uh, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, I'll do a few did you knows, and then we'll talk about the firm. I'm just going to go through superficial real quick, you know, some of the features. Uh, because everybody either has loaded it on their camera already, they've read all the DP review stuff, or uh, basically you go to Nikon USA and you download the Z9 Firmware Update 5.0 Guide, which is a PDF file, and it's like, I think, 87 pages long. And that'll take you step-by-step step through all the features with the new firmware and, um, you know, you could you could go that route and um, you know um, get all your information that way. So we're just going to kind of eventually go over that real quick. Um, I'm just going to share a few did you knows because I'm going to share like a three minute video with you. Um, Louis uh, Daguerre, okay, obviously a Frenchman. Louis Daguerre designed the first commercially manufactured camera in 1839 okay uh, it was made by alphonse Giraud in paris it consisted of a double box camera based on the experimental work conducted conducted by daguerre aka what they call the daguerreotypes okay which was one of the first well first method of recording a photographic image okay where you had copper plates which got co covered with silver, sensitized with iodine. You took the image and then you developed it by exposing it to hot mercury vapors. Um, Delightful. And so nothing, nothing that 
you or I would want to do today. However, uh, there are, believe it or not, a handful of people in this world today that use that methodology and maybe some of the the steps are not exactly line on line the same as what they did back in the 1800s, but the end result is the same. So I'm going to show you a, a video. I'm going to share a video with you um, that I found on YouTube that I found very interesting. It's maybe three minutes long, and you're going to watch somebody show you how to make a daguerreotype uh, image. So I'm going to bring up the video. Um, so that I could um, let's see uh, and share it. And give me a second. So I'm going to put it up on the screen, and hopefully, like right now, you see nothing. Okay. So now I'm going to play it, and I'm and we can. Uh, it's three minutes and twenty two seconds long, so it's. We're going to start it now. Can you make it full screen? Today, only a handful of yeah. specialists create daguerreotypes. Here, Dr. Mike Robinson makes a portrait using his own version of the technique. That didn't work. Didn't work. Okay. The daguerreotype starts with a silver-coated copper plate which is buffed for a few minutes to produce a mirror-like surface. That's as big as I can go. The plate is placed yeah, down into boxes filled with iodine and then bromide, which react with the silver to make the plate sensitive to light. After a few minutes, the plate is removed from any specks of dust. That's a lot of work and very expensive. The sensitized plate is slotted into a holder for a camera. Setting up the camera for a portrait takes time. Working under a black cloth makes it easier to see the subject through the lens to focus the image. The sitter must remain completely still while the daguerreotype is made or the image will be blurry. <laughs> Once the focus is set, the wooden holder containing the plate is loaded into the camera. The photograph is taken by removing the lens cap to let light in. Exposures can take between 5 and 60 seconds. When enough time has passed, the lens cap is put back on to stop the exposure. The plate, still inside its holder, is now taken out of the camera. At this point, the image is still invisible or latent. To start the developing process and bring out the image, the plate is exposed to mercury fumes in another safe, purpose-built box. The developed plate is removed from the box. It now needs to be fixed to prevent the image from disappearing. Fixing the image with a type of salt, sodium thiosulfate, washes away any remaining light-sensitive silver, stopping it from reacting with daylight. Once all the silver has dissolved, the plate is rinsed with distilled water to remove the fixing solution. Next, to improve the stability and yeah, yeah. of the daguerreotype, a solution of gold chloride is mixed and poured over the plate. The plate is heated to warm the solution and bring out the different tones in the image. A final rinse washes off any excess gold chloride. Lastly, the plate is heated again to dry it. You need to be a chemist. <laughs> they were chemists back then. That's the scary part. A lot of people died doing this back in the day. Imagine how expensive an eight by ten would be. Right. Wow. There, there you go. Catch contrast. Imagine shooting thirty frames per second back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Savings and rewards on yeah. top of our lower than low prices. And no. when you download the Kroger app, you can enjoy over five hundred dollars in savings every week with digital coupons. Uh, Plus, you can earn the one dollar per gallon at the pump, so it's easy to save. Okay, so I now want you, to you you have a commercials in your channel now. 
Absolutely. That's that. Is my, I get sponsored usually by Preparation A. By Kroger. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, but there, I wanted to share that with you because obviously, you know, I'm kind of a photo history nut. And, and once again, I did it to shame kind of all of us in, in saying we got nothing to complain about when we're taking pictures nowadays because imagine the time that was spent just to get one image. And uh, also, uh, I, I found some website. I don't even remember what it was. And somebody had like the full chemistry set. I mean, the chemicals weren't in it, but it had all the flasks and everything. Wow. And it had basically the full set of all the the glass bottles with the labels with all the chemicals on it and and the a camera from the 1800s and they had the whole complete set and and it was like selling for like fifty thousand dollars so there are a handful of people out there that actually have collections of the old cameras with the full basically chemistry set that these people had to use to develop these images quickly because if they were doing the wet processing method, they literally only had minutes. They had to take the take that plate right out of that camera and, and go and develop it if it was wet plate technology. Now, if it was dry plate te technology, which was totally different, then their, their, the time the person had to sit there for an image was nowhere near as long. And they could develop it later. They didn't have to do it right away. Uh, so, uh, but there were, you know, there were so many different approaches to um, photography. And someday I think I'll make up a list of all the different types, let's say the first 30 years of photography or something. And I'll, I'll do a little presentation on all the different types or methods that were used to record uh, images uh, in the day uh, because it's, uh, it gives you a real appreciation for how spoiled we are now. Um, and, uh, you know, people are, there, there's some commentary out there where, where people are complaining uh, about the new firmware update for the, for the Z9 not being worthy of, of being 5.0. It should have been, you know, a lower level change and, all the work they did and and it yeah it may be a lot of little things but little things add up and uh it was a, a big uh effort <clears throat> into what nikon did and you really shouldn't be complaining when you get it for free and david stewart joins us he's back he's he's, he's no longer walking because his legs are sore from dancing all night long i take it well, I, I, I'm, I'm here. It was a good night of dancing. There was about 60 of us, you know, from all over Alberta. But getting back to uh, your, your camera, there is a camera in at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver that's part of a horse-drawn carriage. The camera is built in. You actually sit inside the camera when you do the exposure. It is that big. So, <laughs> so no, but, yeah, yeah, very, very good. Sorry, David. Uh, it's good to to pay homage to those people that did that type of photography, correct? Oh, oh uh, yeah. Uh, uh, for instance, I know, uh, you know, one of the famous expedition to Yellowstone was done in 1871, and it's called by by Hayden. Correct. Which that's the now in if any of you that visit the Tetons and the and the, um, the Yellowstone, correct? One of the places that you will photograph, correct, in the in the Tetons will be the Oxbow uh, the Oxbow Lake in front of Mount Moran. Well, Moran was the actual photography of the of the expedition, and you, to your point, correct. They have to take a wagon specifically for the photography. A full wagon has to travel with all the chemicals and the plates and everything to imagine. I mean, to take that where there was no road to Yellowstone, correct? That's uh, into the wilderness. So that that we, we need to take a, like we took our hat to Escubarasi. Well, we need to, to appreciate the people, correct? Uh, that, that did all that to create 
the Suave that we enjoy now, right? Yeah, I mean, many many of those photographers died from exposure to the chemicals or sometimes explosions or fires that they would have as a result of what they were doing. And, uh, you know, you, you, you typically, we, we certainly, when we go out shooting pictures, we're not looking at it as a life-threatening hobby or, exactly. or profession. But back in those days, it literally it literally was a life-threatening uh, hobby. And, um, and, and, they, and they were not just people pushing a button. They were, chem- they, they were chemists, exactly. you know, they, and, and over time, you know, certain, because uh, at one time when the, um, the, they didn't always, in the beginning, they didn't have fixers. So when, the, when photography first started and they took an image, the image eventually would fade and go away. Okay, yeah. it, didn't, it didn't have any life to it. So it, it then as time went on, you know, someone developed a fixer to stabilize to Dang. stabilize the process so that that image was was not going to fade away. So there were all these evolutions and, and it was all like, OK, now we got a new chemical. We got to pour on that on that silver coated copper plate to make wow. sure the image doesn't fade away. And uh they were always they were always developing new methods using different chemicals or or silver halide uh, in a in a gelatin which was a dry plate. It was like pre pre made plates ready for you to you know put in put into your uh, into your your holder. Okay, for those big plate cameras. And they were already pre-coated. They already had the light-sensitive material on the plates. And actually, Kodak bought the first company that that created that process. Okay, Kodak bought them up. Okay, before they came out with film, with what we know as as regular film, and they bought the plate company. Uh, because, you know, they had to have a try to get a corner on the market somehow, right? So they, they bought, you know, these manufacturing companies that made dry plates. And, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, that was, like I said, before they came out with the uh, first, the Kodak, what they called the Kodak, which was the first camera, uh, which was, which was kind of like part of uh, my next, did you know, in 1888, they marketed that camera named the Kodak, and it was it was basically a ca- camera that was preloaded with film that was sealed inside. It was a hundred exposures. So you bought that camera. It cost twenty five bucks back wow. in the day. Twenty five dollars. You had a hundred pictures. You shot those hundred pictures. You had to send the whole camera back to Kodak, and they had to open it up you know, in a dark room, whatever, and get that film out and process it. Now, so that was in 1888. So by in 1901, talk about a big, talk about a game changer. Okay, I'm going to use that <laughs> word. I'm dying to use that word. A game changer. It that was, was in, in a real game changer in 1901 when the brownie cam, first brownie camera came out. The camera costs a buck. Camera costs wow. a dollar. And you used roll film. You 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 exposed the film and you took it out and you sent it in to get developed. But the original roll film was only six pictures on it. It was only six images. So uh, from the daguerreotype that you were talking about in the late 60s, 1860, to basically a roll of film that were familiar, it took only 40 years, correct? Right, 40 years. And in between, you had, like I said, you had the uh, the dry plate technology. You had uh, tin tin plates that they developed images on, uh, and there were there were some others that I I kind of ran across in some reading the other day that I had never even heard of. Like I said, I could probably spend a couple weeks getting all the details of of every, of everything from what we just saw to. Uh, obviously uh, 1900 and one uh, and there were a lot of different things and, and, like, and someone might come up with a process that they didn't use the same name um, you know dragotype 
and they, they called it something else, but it was basically maybe almost exactly the same thing, but one chemical got changed out, which did something better or made something a little bit easier. So these guys were all, they were, they were, I think they were almost really chemists first and photographers second. Yes, and uh, so I applaud what they did because otherwise we wouldn't have anything today. Um, but, but in the early days, like when he, they said that, that, that guy was posing for, up to a minute or something like that, or six minutes or something. In the early days, you might have to pose for 20 minutes. Exactly. It wasn't wasn't six minutes. It was 20 minutes. <laughs> that's, so why that's, nobody that's, why, that's why nobody smiled. Exactly. That's why nobody smiled. You couldn't hold a smile for 20 minutes. Exactly. So everybody just had a, you know, everybody looked like me. Sad Jeff. Sad job, <laughs> you know, or 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 straight faced. You could do that for twenty minutes, but you're not you're not going to do that for twenty minutes. So you know that's why anything from the eighteen hundreds, everybody looks so serious, like their their horse just got shot or something, and they don't have a horse anymore it's because they they've taken a picture was a very painful process for the uh, for the person getting their picture taken <laughs> as well as dangerous for the guy doing the pictures but uh, anyway we'll, we will move forward here because we're in our last 45 minutes uh, yeah. me... Jeff, Jeff I yeah. changed the background to that camera from University of British Columbia Wow that is the lens it, well, it... wait a second let me let me drag you over here. Let me uh, give me a second. Hopefully, it works this time. Beautiful, David. <clears throat> you, you can wow. see that the two back wheels of the carriage <laughs> that are there, and and uh, the doors are open to the sides. <laughs> but but uh, they've got th this inside a pavilion with glass all the way around it, and it's wow. very hard to take a picture of this thing. But it's a full size carriage that wow. you can actually sit inside. When you're taking a picture. It's a traveling camera cure. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I give I give these people credit, man, for what they did in the time. Yeah. No it doubt. wasn't easy. No. It's like that new NASA plane that has no windows. <laughs> well, I thought they had Boeing planes that well, you got Boeing planes that have no doors. <laughs> And they fall off. <laughs> and wheels. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna really go through quick on uh, the night uh, Z9 firmware version 5.0. And some of them, some people may have heard that. And in, in, for some people, they've had to download the firmware twice because the GPS functionality wasn't correct when they downloaded it the first time. They had to download it a second time, and then it. For most people, then it was fine. I didn't check my GPS. I never use it anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, so you may have to download your firmware twice. And I guess some people even sent their cameras back to Nikon from what I understand. But uh, if you follow the instruction, you have to do it twice. The instruction said yeah. that you have to do it twice. So, so uh, and did you check the what happened is after you load it for the first time? He chose the ver the prior version of the GPS. Maybe for some cameras that are more recent, already have the new GPS version and doesn't require an update. But certainly for us here, that bought the camera quite a long time ago, uh, we we have the older version, so we need to do the 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 double uh, the double the double double whammy the double whammies. Yes. Yeah, so, some of the some of the earlier cameras had problems with the GPS uh, module. Mm -hmm. Actually, they were, uh, I think they were 100, 100, 100 years into the future, and you had to send the camera back to Nikon to get it fixed. So, wow. What's the, wow. What's the, what's the version you should see for the GPS? Do you know what the version number is? 1.17. 1. 1. what? 1.7. I tell you in a second. Okay. I think it, it was like 0. 0.17, and now it's 1.17. 1. 1.17. Okay. All right, I'll have, to, I'll have to check mine. I'm sure I'm going to have to download it again. But like I said, I'm not really sweating it because I don't use it anyway. But um, 
the latest version is 0.17, I guess. Mm -hmm. Point well, mine, mine didn't update, so I'll have to do that. Yeah, Jeff, look. Oh, See, now, now it shows three lines. Yeah, mine showed three lines yesterday, but today it's only showing two. Ah, 0.17, okay. Mm -hmm. well, I can look at mine quick and see what it did or didn't do. <laughs> and it was 0. 0.7 before because I took some notes here. Yeah, I'll tell you what mine is in a second. Did you actually have to download it twice? or, or well, did Not download it, but install it twice. Install exactly. it. Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. So. Yeah. If you uh, when you go to the download page, there's a lot of text in red. It's uh, towards the bottom. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and Steve Perry has a tutorial, which you know you typically you're not you just load it, correct? And yeah. then you you wait, but then he put a tutorial and they say, oh, I went back and read it again, and then I find oh I had to redo it. Not redo it. Do the second load. Yeah, mine says 0 0.07. Okay, so you have to do it again. Yeah. But it's, 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 a, it's just like, you know, updating the length firmware. or the, This is updating the firmware of the GPS system. Yeah. Basically. But the... Um... I'm going to go through real quick some of the things. Like I said, get that reference guide from Nikon USA's website, Z9 Reference Guide. Um, I've got it on my computer right now. It's called Z9 underscore film, uh, firm update 5.0 guide dot PDF. So you can go in there and download it and then at your leisure go through every single thing. Mm. Um, now, I'll just go through real quick. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, well, they, they modified auto capture so that you could put in a start date and a time and duration in advance uh, and added it to auto capture. That way, you know, if you may have a, a setup where the camera is really high or whatever and you, you know the event is starting at a certain time, uh, now you can, uh, you know, just set that all up way ahead of time and, and uh, makes life a lot easier for you. Um, and then they added, you know how you have, you can shoot uh, multiple frames per second, you know, with your wheel on your Z9, let's say, and you could do, you know, that 120 frames per second or 60 frames per second. And well, now they added a low speed uh, C15, 15 frames a second has been added to the high speed frame capture, which, you know, uh, to me, that's not a, a huge deal. Um now they did modify the high frequency flicker reduction function, which which that's kind of neat. If you happen to be working with LED panel lighting or LED lights, and you happen to be able to find out what the frequency that those lights work at, you can adjust that flicker control specifically for that frequency, and know that you're going to get um, you know a better image out of it. Uh, so that's something that you didn't have before. Um, they well, added it's the, it's the it's the memory ba uh, banks that they didn't have before that you could always adjust it, but now you can save certain adjustments. So if you're shooting in different environments all of the time, um, it's like a have different frequencies. Yeah, then you can just cycle through them. Yeah, frequency presets. Yeah, that you could put in. Um, and you got the you got some of the benefit you got the benefits from what there's in the Z8 with the rich tone portrait picture control and skin softening and so on and so forth. Uh, so you have that. Um, yeah, we all need skin softening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you say, all right. Hey, I got a baby face, baby. I got a baby face. <laughs> I got a baby head. I got a baby head and a baby face. Um, well, that's why I have a mustache. I can't see, see some, some people. Some people get confused, like which is the which is the back end. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> they say smooth as a baby's behind. They go, okay, which side is it? Um, the you've got. Uh, let's see. 
you now have separate uh, menu banks for video because it used to be photo uh, your uh, photo banks and your video banks were shared and now they're separately uh, they're separate from each other um, you can make the the border width of your focus point uh, thicker if you want it thicker when you look through your viewfinder um, yeah, I think that's A15 or something like that. Yeah, so that's kind of nice. Uh, what I like here is like on, 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 and I hope they put this on the ZF, is when you're shooting manual focus and you hit the middle button in your control pad and you zoom in all the way to optimize your focusing right now on the ZF, you got to hit the OK button to back out before you take the picture. Well, what they did was they, they made it now so that if you, if you zoom in, okay, on your image for manually focusing, instead of having to move your thumb around and hit that OK button again, you could just press your shutter button halfway down and it'll it'll zoom out for you. And then you could just press the shutter wow. and take the picture. So okay. I like that. I hope they put that in the, in the uh, ZF as well. Uh, right now it is not in the ZF. Um, and then they, I'm not going to go over everything, like I said, because we'll be talking for over an hour. Um, they, they made it so there's more functions that are, that are available that can be programmed on the controls than you had before. Some of them might have been very limiting. Maybe you can only, you know, have four different features that you could program a certain, you know, button or, or, or switch to do. Well, now, now you have more choices of, of what you can uh that's, uh, that's actually for me uh, that was the 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 best of the of the firmware because the Z8 you could have that uh, button that allows you to cycle between the different focus modes and that was not available in the C9 and now it's available in the C9. Right. So yes, yeah, so you could you could pick a button now and you can. Is there a, now you you basically go into a menu and you identify what focus mode you want to to be able to to toggle through, correct? Exactly. You you said it being out of all the different modes, you, you select check off the ones you want to use, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. So it's very easy to toggle between, let's say, three D and, and full frame and a single point. Uh, I assign it to the actual. Uh, uh, to the to the actual uh, record button during uh, still photography, and then you can cycle very quickly, correct, with your finger, um, in case that you need to do so. So it, it, that that is actually a big improvement. Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, Pavel, it sounds like you do as much video as I do. <laughs> well, it it is it, it's, it's a that that that. Uh, David, you that's in stills mode. You program the record button to do something when you're in the stills mode. Exactly. It doesn't affect how it's used when you're in video mode. Actually, on the video mode, I have a program, the shutter, to initiate my video. So I don't have to go from that one. Um, I'm cool with that. If you're, um, if you're playing back your videos on your camera, you can now uh, specify you know, what speed you want to view them at. Um, okay. Um, I don't use SnapBridge, but they, they changed the Wi-Fi so that you can enable connection to SnapBridge without using the entire Wi-Fi connection on your smartphone so you can still do other things. Um, that was annoying. They, they, they fixed a, a problem where if you're using that fancy MC-N10 remote grip, like if you got your camera on a tripod and you got the grip lower so you can do some camera controls on it, uh, and you were using an Atmos air glue accessory, um, you can now use it uh, and connect it via Bluetooth at the same time. And before, I guess you couldn't do that. Um, you know, the... So that's... You know, I mean, there there are other little things. Um, 
you know, buried in there. Now I saw, although I, I didn't see it in writing, I don't, I didn't read through every, every sentence of that 87 page document that they came out with, but there was, I think uh, it might've even been uh, Matt Irwin uh, made a comment that supposedly the autofocus is better in low light um, on a video that he did, but I don't remember seeing that in writing in the manual, but it could very well be. I, I may have just not seen it. Uh, cause I did not read it line by line. Um, but, uh, you know, they did a, they did a fair amount of things to it. And, uh, and some of them, I really think that cycling through some of the auto function focus uh, functions is a really big deal because you may find that instead of programming other function buttons for different, uh, for changing exactly. your uh, autofocus methodology, you may just say, I'm okay with just cycling through, you know, you just, maybe you just pick the three methods that you use the most and, and, and switch between those three. And it's not going to take you that much longer than pushing different buttons on your camera. Right. And then it frees up those buttons that you could program to do something else. So it is exactly. kind of a good, it is kind of a neat, a neat thing to do. Um, the, the, the thing the thing here, Jeff, that is interesting for discussion is not what we got, but what we didn't get. Yeah, I mean, that's what's showing <laughs> some people is that we didn't get uh, the pre, <coughs> pre-release pre functionality with RAW mm -hmm. formats. And, uh, and then some people were mad because it doesn't have the uh, pixel shift. Exactly. Um but you know, you know what I'm saying. It, it, it you know, a <laughs> well, I'll, well, I'll play back that movie again. How that guy had to develop that uh, <laughs> that picture, and then decide if you want to complain about that, because you're getting something for nothing. So you know, I mean, I mean, one can argue too, and I've said it before. And Nikon obviously doesn't feel that it that it hurt their sales of their cameras or anything. I mean, they could very easily have made the camera shoot 30 frames per second at a slightly different bit rate, uh, which is basically what the Sony A1 did. And they could have matched that with the Z9 anytime they wanted to, and they never chose to do it. But if they wanted to do it, they could do it like that. But they haven't done it. So obviously they don't feel that not shooting 30 frames a second or not being able to say, hey, we shoot 30 frames a second, you got to have 30 frames a second, that it's really that big a deal because they haven't done it. They don't feel it's that important. Well, uh, and it also tells us that uh, there is more firmware to come, which is good. And it also tells us that they have more than one team because I think that this is not the same team doing the Z8, the ZF, and the Z9. It's different, you know, software developer. They coordinate somewhere between them, but it's not the same. Right. Yeah, they have yeah. different sets of programmers and different sets of lens makers. Exactly. Different teams. Like yeah. the top team of lenses that work on certain lenses, and the other ones that work on the DX lenses. Well, I, I think what's what's going to happen is you're going to start getting some of the <laughs> some influx of people from Red, and vice versa. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. They've got some we're, good we're, programmers yeah. in Red. Yeah, it, it'll it'll shake things up quite a bit. Maybe they can fix. Prep bridge. <laughs> well, <laughs> oops. It, it, it is getting better, Roy. You know, it but, is slowly, yeah. well, very it's, slowly. But it's a small company, David. <laughs> I, I I know it, it. It's a small company, but it, but they are they are getting better, you know. Mm. And they need different programmers uh, for Snap Bridge. They definitely do. <laughs> yeah. That's where red comes in. I hope so. That's my big hope. I don't think You're red will fix snap bridge. Red red will fix the cameras. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, but, but, and they, uh, they 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 also snap bridge. I think Nancy was mentioning before. They also introduce uh, the the you know uh, upgrades that will be compatible with uh, pre-focus light on the Profo uh, Profoto A10. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. so the people that have the A10, like me, 
that that's that helpful as well, correct? And Nancy mentioned that she has a Profoto A10 as well. So that tells you that definitely Nikon is working very closely with with the with Profoto, correct? Mm -hmm. See, see, the problem with SnapBridge is you need Android programmers, you need iPad programmers, exactly. and they got to talk to the people that are doing the firmware for each camera. And, and so the coordination on this has got to be atrocious, you know, <clears throat> and, and as poor us little guys sitting out here finding that this thing is, well, I still have hair, but barely, <laughs> you know. But and uh, and uh, it, it is very hard to add a new camera, or much harder than it should be. And every so often, it forgets what camera that I have, and I got to get rid of it and add it. And oh, yeah. Yeah, David, come on, join the club, baby. Join the club. <laughs> who, <laughs> who loves you, baby? Where's my lollipop? Where's my lollipop? My coat jack. <laughs> but, but I tell you one thing, David, that you mentioned, right? The other day, you oh, we got Roy upset. <laughs> <laughs> it just committed suicide also. again. Roy fell down again. Roy's upside down. Upside down, it's just Roy. It's a webcam. It keeps falling off the stand. Yeah. <laughs> so, David, you mentioned when, when we talked last week about, you know, yeah, updating yeah. your your fault, <laughs> your time zone and your be a snap bridge okay yeah so you, you mentioned that to me so i went back to snap bridge and um and and i tried to work with it not not to just to see if there is some progress on there okay yeah i tell you i i was trying to program in my iphone the snap bridge to work both with the c8 and the z9 because i say hey maybe having an additional remote control for the clips will be good Right. Yeah, I, I couldn't make it. I, I, the software allows you to 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 have more than one camera, but I tried like three more times, and you know I wasted like two hours. That's exactly what Roy is saying. It is not intuitive. I, well, I I, I would um, use different <clears throat> uh, adjectives <laughs> that, that are closer to what Roy would think than you were saying. Yeah, well. But, you but, know. Uh, the, see, there's no reason why am, but. <laughs> why SnapBridge can't be hooked onto more than one camera at a time, because it's just Bluetooth, you know, and and, uh, and you should be able to switch cameras very easily. You can't. I've got my SnapBridge on my phone set up for four different cameras. Exactly, and, and it is a pain switching from one to the other. Well, exactly. Uh, you know, it, and uh, but when it works, it works well, and but that is only when it works. Exactly. No, I, I, I even had to disable the, the the DA50 that I have in the Snap Bridge to make it work. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> what is this? No, what, 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 what I do now is when I switch cameras, I switch it in the app, and, and then even when I go to turn on a new camera. Well, what uh, I will do is I will have it resync, and I go to the camera, and I'll turn on and off airplane mode, and then the two usually work together. Wow! But but uh, <clears throat> and then I check it to make sure that it is working. Now, I wish there was a SnapBridge alternative, alternative because now uh, Nikon is not selling the GPS anymore. So I can't go and buy a GPS and put on my Z8 or my ZF. Okay. Well, actually, the, the ZF doesn't even have a place to plug the, the GPS in. I've got a GPS. Well, yeah, because that uh, used to plug into the 10-pin uh, connector. Yeah, I love with, the 10-pin. Yeah, I, I love the 10-pin connector. Yeah, well, yeah. the 10-pin was nice, but where is it on the F? Exactly. Well, you you got you got effed. You got effed. Mm. You got effed. It could be better, baby. Oh, 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 yeah. It definitely could be better, and, and it's a coordination mm. problem. And, and and I wouldn't want to be the the person at Nikon that has to put up with all this. But I I I sympathize with Roy. You know, and if you're not computer literate. 
It is a piece of whatever. It is, and it's unstable. Yeah, but, but uh, for, from the programming side, it, it's a coordination problem that, that uh, I wouldn't want to have. <laughs> the um yeah it's just I, I i can't i can never i never comment on snapbridge because i i do not try to ever transfer anything to my phone well I, I, I don't like my phone i don't i don't, I don't like phones period uh it, i just have a thing against phones uh well, so i don't do anything where i got to talk to a phone any more than i have to but uh so i, I can never one does it better so, Moss, you're, te you're telling us that uh, that Jeff in the past life was Telly Savalas? <laughs> That's right. Who <laughs> loves you, baby? It's, see, yeah, how, see, how, see, how far, see how far I have fallen since the good old days? <laughs> <laughs> in, no, in those days, in, in, in these days, uh, I made money for, you know, being on TV. <laughs> now, 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 I'm on YouTube and... Uh, the money is uh, is painfully uh, absent. <laughs> I, I tell you what, every time that I see Teresa, I remember a story when I was in university. We had one of those big mathematical courses. I don't know what it was, uh, you know. It, and um, there was an exam that was, you know, difficult. And then we had the professor that worked in an auditorium. And the professor gave the grade to everybody, correct? And then say, I want to know one more thing. Who the hell signed the exam? Telly Savala. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys keep it going for a minute. My dog disappeared. I got a feeling she's at the door wanting to go outside. So oh. I'll be right back. Yes, Camera Control Pro from Nikon works fairly well. It's better than Scrap Red, um, the other thing. But um, you, you have to pay for it. Exactly. Capture One's probably the best of the tethering programs. I shoot tethered yeah. most of the time. Is it wireless or with a cable? Um, it's cabled. I use cable. I don't, I've never tried it without. Yeah, because uh, I, I've got. Um, but whenever I use my my Z8, I I'm I use uh, Snapridge for the GPS function. Mm. You know, because and, I like and, and that, everything. That that's actually what they suggest, right? Yeah, it, it works really well with that. But with uh, the Wi-Fi, I refuse to use it because it, anyway, I don't think it works. Some of the yeah. places I work, um, you can't trust the Wi-Fi because there's things to stop it working. Yeah. yeah. Well, but it's also Bluetooth, uh, Roy. In, in principle, in principle, you can do like, you know, if you have a remote camera, and then you can change your settings be either to trigger the camera like a remote control but also change the setting via bluetooth so so the intention for snap reach are good it's just that the, the execution and as you say it's, it's not stable that's the other thing right? the processor in these cameras is similar to the one in phones it's an arm so i don't see what the problem is learning the code if i knew how to program arm i'd do it myself yeah, yeah, it, uh, it it should work much better than it does. But, but uh, of all the things that, that that Nikon does, this is one of the very few things we got to complain about. Yeah, you got to complain about something. Oh yeah, you you've got to you've got to have something for people to complain about. You know, I'm not gonna be happy. Oh yeah, uh, and of course the cameras are a lot more complicated, but. Uh, updating the software on the Profoto A10, David, it was easy. You put, you bring your your app for Profoto, you put the two flashes there, you turn it on, it goes to the first one, it, 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 it downloads into Bluetooth to the, to the flash, you finish that one, and then it does the other one. That's what we want, something, you know, reliable and simple. Yeah, I have it, to say it doesn't yeah. work on most mirrorless cameras. When, with, uh, when I update my Olympus cameras, I, I plug it into my computer using the USB, and, and there is an Olympus app that I fire up, and, and it does everything. 
and it updates the lens and whatever you got. If you got multiple lenses and you then you change lenses and you do it again. Mm. You know, and and then uh, <clears throat> you know it, it's all really simple. You know, it tells you when it's done and 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 then you just go ahead. It's uh, there's none of this put, putting your your information on your on your card and putting it in your camera and turning your camera on and and uh, <clears throat> turning it off accidentally and all the rest of this stuff, you know, and and, and buggering it up, but. But anyway, it just Olympus has has a better system, but not everybody can be like that. But in the meantime, I did get my Z8 back. Oh, okay. From Nikon, it only was away for ten days, and I hope you I mind. found the screw that was loose, because okay. when I <clears throat> when the, the when I, I should out, have mounted it for you as a souvenir. Did you shake it good when you got it? Well, I shook it really good. When when the strap came off, because I wanted to figure out where it was, if it was in there, but it was stuck someplace. Wow. So I don't know how long it took. To but anyway, but I found out that uh, rather uh, to to put it in, if you put a drop of linseed oil on it when you put the screw in, then you can get it out. It's mu it works much better than Loctite. But uh, they, David, they, they, I mean, I know that you did the update before. Now that you send it the second time, did they charge you any money? Nope. Okay. No, nope. and it it came back back free, and and I had my uh, camera stop shop send it in for me, okay. and and uh, I didn't even pay for shipping. Nikon paid for shipping both That's ways. Yeah, you know, and uh, it got moved to the top of the line. You know, so very good. I'm I'm happy. Well, a few times I've had to send cameras in; they've been brilliant. When I had the Sony A7, I sent it in about half a dozen times. I couldn't find the problem. Then it ran out of warranty, and they didn't want to see me anymore. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Anyway, they made their own service. Yeah, <clears throat> but uh, it is kind of funny when I had my F mount cameras. I never sent anything in. When I had my Z mount cameras, this is three times something's gone in. So one of those was my fault, sort of. My lens, my 100 to 400 fell off my Z9 and damaged the mount. But that that was fixed in two weeks, mm -hmm. and 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 I I was impressed. And it's got two serial numbers on it now, because the part that was damaged had the serial number on it. But it also has an interior serial number that that uh, Photoshop sees, and the two aren't the same. The, the one Photoshop sees is the original one. The one everybody else sees is a new one. Long as the long as the warranty counts. Well, anyway, I think the warranty is up now. So, but, well, my my D eight fifty. I was just told a. Won't have the part to replace my top uh, protective LCD plate until the maybe the end of the month. So wow, uh, that's so annoying. Good thing that uh, that it's not a highly used camera body anymore. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's still a shame that uh, a part like that, which I know, I think I told you guys, I I found the part on a parts list available to buy for the the same. Well, not the same, but the same idea. Protective top plate for the LCD on the on the D90 cost a whopping two dollars and eighty cents. Should have bought it and sent in with the camera. It cost two dollars and eighty cents. Yeah. I don't think it's that much more for for the D850. You would think that uh, you would stock a few because it's not like it's breaking the bank. But uh, they don't stock much in these places anymore. They just stop the minimum. Yeah. But anyway, I can wait. Whatever, not going to kill me. Uh, I threw, threw up this comment that was in the chat, and yeah, you know, uh, I just I got only one comment and more to uh, towards Fro. I, I well, I don't really watch either one of these guys, but with Fro anyway, I would just say, you know, how many times is he is he threatening us with going back to Nikon? Well, uh, don't be in any hurry, buddy, because you don't really say anything good about them. But stop threatening us that you're going to go back to Nikon. Just stick with what you got. <laughs> <Yeah>. Agreed. <laughs> you know, uh, 
the uh, well, I, the one good thing about them always complaining is that maybe Nikon listens a little bit and and it gives them a little bit of a poke, you know. But uh, anyway, somebody's got to complain that there's got an audience to get things, make things better. Because the, the competition to be listening to, and they may put it in first, and then that puts more pressure on Nikon. But that's just a thought. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just looking to see if I – I got some stuff I could read, but I'm not going to. We're getting near the end of the show here, and it's really nothing that mind-boggling. It was just a few comments in the early – in the early announcement days of uh, Nikon buying red, you know, from India Today, Tech in New Delhi, you know, why did they decide to do it? Match made in heaven. Uh, both both custom companies committed to provide the best experience possible to the customers, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And uh, that's a scary, that's a scary image right there. I don't want to look at that. <laughs> That's uh, it's not that kind of show, Jeff. It's not that kind of show, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and he's, that's a little bit more flexibility than I've had in about fifty years. So exactly. <laughs> but you talk, uh, about, you, talk about, you talk about talking out, out of your arse. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you see, photographing out of your arse. If you could have. Like you could have had the mouth where the camera was. That would have been fantastic. <laughs> I, I just I'm wonder sure uh, it, how, how he uh, looks at his display when the camera's down there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, what, you know, how does he twist it around? You know? Must have another set of eyes somewhere we don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it must yeah. be second head. <laughs> Yeah, as, as we as we go down the tunnel of disaster at the end of the show here, we're, we're in the crash and burn mode right now. I apologize for that photo. Ten minutes. <laughs> did, oh. I want to know, did you take it, Roy? No, I didn't. Okay, well, as long as you, you didn't actually find joy in taking that image, then I'm okay. <laughs> but uh, let's see what else there's. You know, they just... Basically, you know, it's funny. All these, all these quotes from these magazines are basically just throwing compliments on both sides of the, you know, both companies. You know, complimenting Nikon for what they do, complimenting Red for what they do, and and you know how they're going to be able to leverage uh, themselves and and share uh, improved product development and and you know obviously as we said uh, in the beginning uh, a few weeks ago or whatever they're going to pick each other their engineering teams are going to pick each other's brains and they're going to decide you know what what aspect of each company could benefit the other the quickest in the near term and then develop and then develop other plans for uh things a little bit farther out in the future um but uh like uh, i said okay. This thought that Z, a Z63 is going to have red technology in it is a, is a pipe dream, in my opinion. Somebody smoking Who cares? Something. Somebody Most smoking works. Something real good. Just yeah, give me two USB ports. I'll be just, happy. Just come out with it. Just come out with it for crying out loud, you know? Well, tell us what it's going to be. <clears throat> well, we'll see that the problem with the compression that, that Nikon uses in the raw files, that's part of the XT7 chip. You know, and the only way that they can get that in the Z6, whatever, is to change chips. And that's why that's in the ZF and the Z8 and the Z9. And for, for the to get any of this stuff from red, we got to have an X speed 8 or 9 that, that has it and then mm -hmm. to come forward. And that takes a number of years to develop. And then you got to make them. Exactly. But, but the nice thing about it, is Nikon can make its own lithography machines mm. for making the chips. So we have an advantage that way. I like that Nikon's the only company that makes their own glass for their lenses as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, 
you know, all these, uh, like Tim and I were talking before the show, um, you know, a Viltrox popping out lenses like crazy for the Z mount, you know, and uh, they got a bunch of autofocus lenses coming out. Some of them that are, you know, pretty, pretty darn fast, uh, matter of fact. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I wonder how much, uh, how much Nikon fears or, or how any of the camera brands fear uh, the Chinese really, really ramping up lens development and uh, lens offerings for all the camera brands at price points that obviously are um, very appealing to pretty much anybody as long as, you know, uh, as long as you understand maybe what you're not going to get with the $500 lens or the $800 lens versus the $2,000 lens, and you're willing to, to live with the differences. But it doesn't seem like uh, any of the camera manufacturers at least uh, consciously are saying out loud that they're, that they're really, really worried about their market share on their lenses getting affected. But you would think that that it kind of would start getting affected. Uh, They're think, getting better. The Chinese know. lenses are getting much better. Trouble is you're getting tiny little stepper motors that are going to wear out, and you're getting plastic elements in the lenses instead of glass. And they're, they're not going to be the same quality, but they're cheaper. It's better to have a lens that works than have none at all. Yeah. Well, well if you, it all boils down to how much you're going to use it. Yeah. You know? And if I... And you're going to pay for quality, and and Nikon will almost always have better quality, you know. And the way I look at it, if between Sigma and Nikon, if if the price difference is less than fifty percent, I I think twice, you know. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's still in the same way or not, but in the early days of Sigma, when they were making lenses for Nikon, their lenses were much heavier. Yeah. I don't know if that's still true or not because I don't buy signal. They're lenses. big and heavy still, but they're much better than they used to be. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, you know, <clears throat> some some of the glass that I'm looking at, Sigma is coming out at f 1.4, where the Nikon glass is mm -hmm. 1.8. So automatically, mm -hmm. the Sigma glass would be heavier, being 1.4. You know, Sigma, but, Sigma's uh, coming out with uh, three f 1.2s, a 35, a 50, mm -hmm. and an 85. Just announced. Yeah. Well, I, I want shorter than that, Mosman. So, like, like I'm getting down to 15 and 20, you know, and, and I, I've got a 15, and but I want to replace my 20. I got the F mount, and, and it's, uh, but the difference between the Sigma and the Nikon is that small right now that I'm waiting for the Nikon to come out and sale because it'll be the same price as the Sigma. The only thing is the Nikon is 1.8 and the Sigma is 1.4, but I'd rather have the quality. Not enough to worry about. It's not enough difference. Yeah. But to look at these lenses, the rating, like the F rating, is not exactly accurate sometimes. Yeah. And then we start getting cinema lenses, which would be nice because they'll all be in T stock. It would be nice. Pardon? An anamorphic one would be nice. Yeah. Well, they were they were actually saying for a long time that the the Z18 lenses were basically the same as or or basically you know as good or better than the one four F mount lenses were. Well, uh, and what we said, and Nikon is primarily an optic company, correct? Okay? It's primarily a lens manufacturing optic company. Yeah. So, so, so that that's good for this deal because they will have, you know, a company that know how to build good glass, right? Yeah. Like I, I'm really impressed with the S line glass, you know, and I still have a lot of F mount stuff that I'm slowly replacing, you know. But some of my stuff I don't, I may only use for a, a thousand shots a year, or so. It gets expensive replacing that because that's a, a dollar a shot for that that piece of glass, mm -hmm. you know. And then I'm starting to, to look at it this way: is how much does it cost me to take a picture? Yeah. And, and for an awful lot of my my stuff, it's over a dollar a shot, you know. 
you could you could buy film at that rate. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I could buy film. You know, it, it, switch, the film. switch the film, Dave. Just switch the film. <laughs> <laughs> Instax. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can loan, I can loan you a camera or two. <laughs> and he, then I need glass for it. <laughs> well, for that matter, I still have my Nichromat EL, and I can use my glass on it. Mm. You know, <laughs> you know, so. So when, when not an EM. Yeah. No, uh, I, I don't bad. want a camera that goes yip yip. Randall. Yeah, Randall just say here, here you go. Of my cat. Here, let me get a bit. Now you can see it. No, Try it, it focused. It, it's focused on your eye. There you go. Uh, it's, a, it's high definition, so it's not the best. High definition cat. <laughs> you can when you could count every whisker it gets scary you know when you can count oh every. yeah well i got the um 24 to 120 on it so i'm just trying out to see if it worked uh, uh how can i look at my firmware update it said uh g is that the gps firmware yes okay so it's like 0.17 and then, you're good. Twice. then you're good. Yeah. You're good. Oh, okay. I'm point zero seven because I only downloaded it once. I got to do it a second time. I only did it once. It, you only okay. updated it once. I only updated it once, so I got to update it. And you put it in program mode, right? Yeah. No. No. That, that's professional mode. Yeah. <laughs> that's what the P stands for. P's for Pro Photo mode. If you have Pro Pro, pro <laughs> Photo Flash. You put it on P. <laughs> I'm going to have 100 people that are going to believe that comment. <laughs> that's, the scary, that's the scary part. Um, oh. You'd be surprised at how many people think that P is, is for professional mode, you know? Yeah. And Mookie, it's never a bad time to say this, uh, but it, it will. Not, I don't think you're going to see it from Nikon. You're going to see it no. from a third party manufacturer that's going to. Do it's it. already being developed, isn't it? I think there's one being developed. Well, they, they got one that's being developed to put a Nikon screwdrive lens on a Sony body, but not on yeah. a Nikon, not, not on a Nikon body yet. That's a really good IFD lens. It's uh, they're, they're to try put it. It on, which which really kind of I would think really irks a lot of Nikon owners is like, okay, you got a company that's that's gonna let you use D lenses, Nikon D lenses on a on a Sony mm -hmm. body. Then why can't we uh, why can't we get one for the Nikon camera? So yeah, I, yeah. I wonder if Nikon's just not gonna but, but that, and they're not gonna let anybody else do it. But then you buy the adapter to go from Sony to Z. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And hope it works. <laughs> well, I don't know. And then and then all of a sudden your your lens that, that was this big is now this big. <laughs> Aren't you glad mirrorless cameras are so small compared to DSLRs? Yeah, yeah, whatever happened to that theory? That, that theory blew the wind when they when they well actually I shouldn't say that got blown away. It it still exists if you're it the it it if you want the optimum glass with the optimum quality. And the Nikon lenses are always going to be bigger because they have to be because the flange mount's bigger. So the, the mm -hmm. smallest the part of the lens is going to be bigger than anybody else's lens. So it's going to be bigger. So if you want if you want smaller lenses, then you buy mirrorless cameras with with smaller lens openings, and you'll have smaller you'll have a shorter glass, smaller well, glass. Well, what you do is you buy Olympus. You know, well, oh. yeah. If you want to, if you want to deal with four thirds, micro yeah. four thirds. Well, then, if you want smaller, if you really smaller. want smaller, use your phone. Yeah, yeah. Double. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to argue with you, Roy. Okay. <laughs> if you if you really want something small, buy a pinhole camera and use film. <laughs> Fill a hole in the lens cap. <laughs> you, you know, guys, out of all the saga of the of the red and, and nickel that it have been interesting to watch, is because obviously this is big news, correct? So he has transcended the 
the YouTube channels that deal with cameras or cinema or cinema. It's also the regular technology channels, right? And when you listen to this in the technology channels, wow, there is so much misinformation. You know, people that you listen to them on, they say Apple stuff, okay? And then they are talking about something that we know a little bit more, correct? What's going on with Nikon? And they got no clue. I mean, they, it's a full of misconception. So, so it's a, it tells you that even those experts in other areas, definitely they are experts on that area, but not in, in this. And they come and, and talk with authority about something that they don't know. Yeah, because my iPad Pro will not read my raw files from any of my Nikon Zs. It's too, but, too nice. but, but I only have three Zs, an 8 and a 9 and an F. I don't know about the 6 and the 7. But, but it won't read the raw files from them. So I shoot raw and JPEG so that when I am traveling and I want to publish a picture, I've got... The, I've got the JPEG. Or else the easier way to do it is to use SnapBridge, and then I can only I only have to shoot raw and I can download that and, and post it. Yeah. Pity we can't stop producing TIFF files. <laughs> TIFF files are very useful. I feel a storm coming on. <laughs> Yes. Come on, where's the storm? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> oh, there, oh, gee, oh, this weather. I don't have an Apple. I mean, I'm using my my IBM machine, so it doesn't do that. So, yeah, but that's why it probably costs you thousands less because it doesn't do that. So, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I think mine is about the same price because it, it's uh, yeah. it's got a lot of power. <laughs> yeah. So Joe is here. Joe is here. He's here and here. And Joe, or you came back, and we're getting ready. To, we, we are going to sign off. Really, any time second now. It's it is our two o'clock. Uh, at at, at two o five, I turn into a pumpkin, so we have to quit it a, a few minutes before two or before two o five, anyway. Uh, but I want to. Uh, I don't know if he's, I don't believe he's still in the chat. I think he finally went back to bed probably is a special thank you to everybody on the panel as always that uh, decides to uh, suffer with me through a Saturday night and uh, offer guidance and uh, constructive commentary, uh, which is sometimes is definitely better than what I offer. <laughs> and, uh, and also special thank you to Scuba Razi for doing that presentation tonight. It was ex very well done, very well laid out. Uh, can't thank him enough for that. And he, and he did it. He did it basically. And we, we talked about it two weeks ago and boom, here, here he was, you know, doing the pitch. So uh, that that's very, very impressive to do that. Uh, so I encourage other people to, to share even a uh, five minute five minute sound bites or, or whatever on, on anything, you know, because um, yeah, we're, we kind of direct traffic and we, we pick some stuff to talk about and whatnot, but the, the, the it, it's all about the community. So the community works best when, when everybody's working together to, help us have a, a good show that people that maybe are not in the community yet, if they stop by, they hopefully get an interest and say, gee, you know, maybe, maybe I want to check this out once in a while. Um, but I do appreciate the uh, steady support uh, from everybody week after week after week. Uh, it just shows that when you get our age, we don't have much of a life anymore. <laughs> except, those, except those that go dancing. Except those that, those, those, those that can do the, those that, anybody that could do the jig in a skirt, I tip my hat off to. That's <laughs> drafty. Yeah, as long as the wind show, as long as the wind ain't 40 miles an hour, the world is a good place. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that it, it's cooler wearing a kilt than it is pants. Yeah. 
But, so, uh, so, so Jeff, before we sign off here, uh, put the invite for the next uh, photo review because it's coming in two weeks or so. Yes, yes, we can do that here. Yeah, did, did John Ishi send you the the link for Diana's uh, picture? Uh, I could throw that. I I kind of had it in something I already shared, but I'll put it on the screen quick for you. So here's April six, guys. Send it out. Before noon time, the day before, on April 5th, 2048 on the long side, four images at the most, uh, wink, wink, and uh, we will, uh, you know, we will uh, be there or be square, as they say, and I'll put up quickly Diana's um, information, and that link is on the bottom, or, you know, if not much of a link, you'll have to cut and paste it or write it down. But, um, yeah, I went on the Smithsonian, uh, looked up the Smithsonian uh, site, and I searched and searched and searched, and I could not I could not find it. So I finally had to e email John Ishi and say, John, I can't find – I'm on their website. I can't find anything about a current photo contest. They had, they had stuff in there for previous photo contest winners from years gone by, but I couldn't find anything for the one going on right now. And uh, he sent me this link, and it does work. And when you get into that, you look for the category people because there's multiple. <laughs> there are there. <laughs> uh, wait a minute, I'm distracted here. There are there are multiple. <laughs> there are multiple categories, uh, <laughs> and uh, so you want to go to the category, <laughs> category named people, and her. Image is titled Contrast of Time, Echoes of Tradition and Youth. And it's a black and white image of two females, an elderly woman and a young woman. And uh, that will help you find it. And it's, to me, the best image out of the out of the batch. And That's great. So the, the question for David, is that the Stuart Tartan or? Uh, that one. I didn't really see, but it was, uh, there's there's many different Stuart Tartans. Okay. Because if you move Stuart like that, you can maybe get a job. Uh, <laughs> you can maybe get a job with the the dancers in New York. Well, these guys, the rockettes. Are, you might be able to get a job as a rock, male rocket. They, these guys are too slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but but. Uh, the, the Stuarts used to be the royal family in in, in, in the UK. And uh, so I, I went to, to one tartan manufacturer, and they had a choice of 200 different Stuart tartans. Wow. You know, but uh, well, well, I what, what, if, you're, that, if you're shaking it faster than they are, then then uh, <laughs> then uh, you're, you're, you're causing personal injury real fast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but when i was at at sterling castle in 2014 and and sterling used to be the the capital city of edinburgh or, or of scotland and uh they, they had a uh, their display there on tartans and they were saying that uh, when you wanted cloth manufactured you went in to see the weaver and depending on what how much money you had what colors you got to choose from. Oh. oh wow. Yeah. And, and uh, so it wasn't like a clan tartan because it was clan, if it was a clan tartan, your choice would be this. Exactly. But, but because you got to choose what colors that you want in it, it wasn't really a clan tartan. And clan tartans <clears throat> are, are, a, are a figment of uh, Sir Walter Scott's imagination. Okay. He created this in 1822 because George IV yes, was coming up to, to Edinburgh. And the first time a monarch's been up there in 150 years. So Scott created all of these instant Scottish traditions that the majority of Scots believe. But it's all... It's a brave oh. Heart. oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the kilt that the Braveheart wore is not was not never invented more than you know 
Well, you got to have a brave heart to wear a kilt. So maybe <laughs> that's where that came from. <laughs> hey, hey my brave heart was Robert the Bruce, not William Wallace. Let's, uh, let's, let's pack it in for tonight and say goodbye to everybody. Yep. And thanks for your support, everybody out there in the chat. And it was good to see uh, Nancy uh, in the chat. It's been a while since we've seen Nancy. And uh, Ava, good to see you on uh, every week here. And Chuck showing up again. And so, uh, you know, and, uh, and the whole gang, you know, I mean, Jeff and Leslie and Greg and Luke and, I mean, so many people that come on every week. Mookie and, you know, Scuba Razi's pitch, like I said, and it was um, – it's wonderful. So thank you so much for your support. And hopefully we will see you next Saturday. And we'll have this panel of experts and on, this, on this side of me. Uh, and Randall's deciding to run away because he doesn't want to be part of the crew, I guess. Uh, no, uh, it's thunder out. So I know why my dog was acting up now. Ah, okay. And so that's it, guys. Have a good one. Take care. Good night. Bye. Good night.